Good morning. Welcome to new faculty orientation. My name is Suzanne Tapp. I'm the executive director of the Teaching, Learning, and Professional Development Center hosting NFO this year. I think you might recognize my name because I've been emailing you quite a bit. Um, so glad to see you face to face and to welcome you. I also want to welcome our virtual attendees. Um, we're glad to have representatives from Costa Rica, from our new veterinary school in Amarillo, um, from all over the place joining us virtually. A few of the housekeeping details before we get started. One thing that you might notice um, is that between our speakers, I'm gonna be running up here with a wipe and wiping down this clicker, um, trying to use best practices um, to really keep us safe. We worked on that this morning with some social distancing, with staggering our attendance. We're gonna try hard to pay attention to that throughout the day today. Um, you might have noticed that we had some drinks outside. The museum has requested that you keep the lid on your bottle, if you don't mind, just to protect this room. We appreciate that. And may I invite you, if you have questions, some of our speakers may have time to entertain some questions. We'll try to repeat those for our virtual attendees. If you are joining us virtually, you are welcome to email me your questions and we'll get those answered. One thing that we typically do after new faculty orientation is to follow up with a document that answers some of the questions that were answered during the day. So we'll do our best to get those taken care of and to get you the information that you need to succeed. We're gonna jump right in this morning. It is my privilege to welcome Dr. Livenek. Well, good morning. I welcome you to Texas Tech. Uh, I understand you've been engaged in some, the orientation process uh, for several weeks, having seen several videos, and I thank you for all the work that's been done to help prepare this. Uh, I will, uh, I have 30 minutes, I don't intend to speak that long at, or even close to it, so I'll be, be more than happy to take questions. Um, yesterday, we introduced our new women's basketball coach. Her name is Krista Gerlich. Uh, she played here in 1993 when we won the national championship, and she had been interested in this job, had applied a couple times, and we finally came to our senses and hired her this time. But she made a statement that I was struck by. I am an example that good things can happen in 2020. And I hope you, being at Texas Tech, have that same sentiment. Good things can happen in 2020. And I'm very glad that you're here. Uh, this is an amazing institution uh, for many, many reasons that I'll try to touch upon. But there's a lot of wonderful things going on. So I say to you, congratulations for all of the successes you've had and the achievements that have brought you to this point in your career. And I hope that um, next year, you will really retain that sentiment that good things did happen in 2020. Uh, so I want to touch upon some of the things going on around the university. Um, this morning I saw there was a very nice article in the Chronicle of Higher Education featuring Jamie Hansard, who was appointed this past year as Vice President of Admissions and Enrollment Management. And there was an extensive interview uh, with Jamie talking about the fact that we had gone test optional for admissions. Um, you, you, you might look at it. Um, so as of yesterday, we already exceeded last year's enrollment. That was not like an obsessive goal. Um, given all the concerns we have about managing this environment, it even causes me greater anxiety. But we're about 4% above where we were a year ago. In terms of transfers, we're up about 25%. Now, why would that happen? Well, in large part, due to the work of Jamie Hansard, Shannon Venencia, who was hired this past year as the Director of Financial Aid. They've done an amazing job. At Texas Tech, since 2016, we have put an additional $24 million of institutional funds into scholarships. Uh, in 2016, we had six national merit finalists on this campus. This year's class will have the second highest total ever, over 20. We'll have close to 90 national merit. 
Um, in 2016, we had 1,000 presidential scholars. Those are students who have an SAT in excess of 1,200 in the top 25% of their class. Last year, we had over 3,500. We'll have a record this year. We have an increasingly outstanding student body, and um, we've committed to supporting them with scholarship dollars. This year, we'll give out over $350 million in financial aid. That includes loans, but about half of that is scholarship. Um, we started a new program this summer called the Matador Scholarship, which is aimed exclusively at students of need. In this country today, there's more money going to merit than to need. And when you look at the number of first generation students in colleges, in universities, and you look at the socioeconomic issues, I believe we have an obligation to provide greater support for students of need. Um, the uh, commissioner of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board retired this last year. We have a new commissioner, Harrison Keller. He's a fabulous supporter of Texas Tech, and I, I really feel positive about what he's going to do. But when Raymond Paredes retired, I was having dinner with him one night. I asked him, in the 15 years you were a commissioner, what were the, some of the biggest changes you saw in higher ed? And he made a, a startling comment. Uh, I believe that universities today promote inequity. And what he meant by that was, if you look at the number of students in Texas public institutions, there's a very small percentage of students who come from the bottom 25% of the socioeconomic class. And we have promoted that by our selective process. And uh, he also said the other thing that's changed is the emergence of universities like Texas Tech who are now recognized as national research universities. Um, and, and, and so um, you're coming to a school in which there's a great deal of interest. Our applications are up by five or 6,000 this year. Our student body is, competitively, is increasingly competitive. Um, every week I get a report on retention. We're going to set a record for first year retention this year as we did last year and the previous year, it's going to exceed 88%. Five years ago, it was 80. Five years ago, our freshman class had 4,700 students. This year, it would be about 6,400. But in spite of that size, we're still retaining those students. Our graduation rates are not what we want them to be. That's one of the biggest uh, negative factors we have in things like US News and World Report, but who cares about that? Um, and it's it was. It was our second highest ever last year. Last year we set a record for five-year uh, graduation rates and four-year rates. But those are things that you play a tremendous role in and how you affect our students. Um, there was a survey uh, released by the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities a few months ago, a couple months ago. and. Um, they followed up on a survey they had conducted 10 years ago where they went out to recruiters and asked them to rank universities who produced uh, the most desired graduates. And Texas Tech, in this survey, came in number nine in the nation. Uh, the other schools in the top 10, or I have some of them here, Harvard, MIT, New York University, Ohio State, Penn State, and UCLA. We were number one in the state of Texas. Uh, we ranked num number nine in, among these recruiters as a school with the best trained, educated, and able to succeed once hired graduates. Um, they said that more than nine in 10 recruiters say Texas Tech does an excellent job of preparing students for the workforce. Um, when asked directly, eight in 10 recruiters say that the school does an even better job compared to other universities. Um, they said that corporate recruiters seek out Texas Tech graduates largely due to the school's overall reputation as well as the preparedness and the work ethic of our students. And I would say that's a reflection of the faculty and the staff as much as it is of our students. It also says a lot about our alumni. So you're coming to a school that is known for producing wonderful graduates. Remember that some days when you're frustrated with those students. 
because uh, I know it's not all roses. Um, you're also coming to a school with a very diverse population. Um, last year, we were formally um, uh, uh, designated as eligible for Title III and Title V funding uh, as a Hispanic serving institution. About a, a couple of weeks ago, I got a call from the chancellor at University of Chicago, Illinois, about an initiative we're going to begin for the Carnegie R1 institutions that are Hispanic serving institutions. There's only 15 Carnegie R1, highest research activity, that are HSI. And we've received a grant that's going to help us um, do a better job of addressing the needs of those students uh, the, uh, the, in those di more diverse groups where we have graduation rates that are typically not equal to the graduation rates of the general population. Yesterday, Carol Sumner told me that we were again awarded the Higher Education and Excellence Diversity Award. That will be f five years in a row and designated a diversity champion. I think we're one of like 15 schools in, in the United States that have that. Uh, last week, we uh, it was announced that Texas Tech uh, was designated as a five-star uh, five campus pride university in the top 25 in the United States, one of two in the state of Texas. That is a reflection of the work uh, that is going on in the office of LGBTQIA, and Jody Randall does a fabulous job in supporting those students. So it's a very diverse campus, but those numbers are not reflected in our faculty. Only about 6-7% of our faculty are Hispanic, about 2% are African American, um, about 40% of the faculty are female, but among the rank of full, it drops down to 25. Uh, that's, um, th that's something we have to work on, we do work on, and we must do better. Um, <clears throat> A few things, uh, I'm a, uh, you may have heard this from Joe Heppert yesterday, but uh, uh, talking about good things that are happening this year. We've already set a record this year for sponsored research. We're going to set a record for new grants. We're going to set a record for federal research. We're going to set a record for total research expenditures. And whenever I start citing things like that, I immediately begin to wonder, how am I sounding to those who are in the visual and performing arts, who are engaged in creative activity, who are in the humanities where, where there isn't necessarily a high priority or opportunity for funding. I, I get it. Research and scholarship comes in many different forms, but those are metrics that do matter in our designation as a Carnegie highest research activity, and we have to pay attention to it. And when we do cite those things, it doesn't mean we're diminishing the full breadth of scholarly contributions that you make, but it's important to us. Um, the other day, I, I, I was looking at the an NSF Higher Education Research Development Survey to see where we were nationally. We're in the top uh, 15, top 10 percent in terms of our graduate program, the top 15 percent in doctorates awarded. That's wonderful. We're producing about 340 to 50 doctorates a year. That's a very substantial number, and that is because of faculty and what you do. Um, I think I, I, those are the main points I wanted to mention there. Um, I, I probably should address so, um, some of the issues that may be on my, your mind related to how we're dealing with the pandemic. We've tried to communicate extensively. Uh, I think we have. If you haven't had a chance to watch like some of the videos on the TTU commitment, you might do that. Um, I hear from, I wish you could read my mail. <laughs> most of it is, most of it is good and some is not so good, but parents and students I think have been imp affected uh, by our opening plans we have created the impression that we're going to try to be as safe as possible. I worry that, um, that there will be moments of disappointment. Um, we're going to have problems. 
I, I don't want to end up in the situation in North Carolina where they opened and then they shut down. I think that what we would try to do, other than going back to phase three, would be to deal with these outbreaks through so, uh, a phrase that people are using now, micro-closures. Um, maybe certain classes will have to be suspended temporarily as you go to online. Um, but students, whether you agree or disagree, wanted to come back. Their parents wanted them to come back. Um, I heard from a staff member this morning after she dropped off her child at school saying how glad they were that the kids were back in school and the things we were doing to open up again. I know not everybody feels that way. And we have to be very, very respectful of those who have health issues or just anxiety about this. When we, we had a open town hall yesterday for the staff and um, Jody Billingsley, who is a, a associate vice president of HR, responded to those questions. I thought with a lot of legalese that that can't be our resort in all instances. We have to go back to the individual situations of people and we try to say, you know, we'll be flexible. Make your case. Be persistent in making your case if you really feel you have a great anxiety about how you're going to teach. But one of the issues I, I addressed yesterday in that town hall, uh, probably the most uh, reoccurring question the staff were asking and uh, complaining about, uh, why are faculty treated with preferential um, opportunities as it relates to how they're on campus and staff are forced to go back? Well, I said, don't be, look, why are we able to, to deal with this pandemic to the effect that we have financially? We had record enrollment this summer. We're going to have record enrollment this fall. Um, the faculty are at the front line in those rooms with those students, in the classroom, in the offices, as our staff. And so don't get the impression that they're not subjected to certain levels of risk as well. And I don't want this to be one group saying another has a preferred position. Um, that they were saying the faculty can have alternative duty points that aren't readily available to us. Some do, yes, but not that many. Texas Tech is about a culture, a culture that is based on its people. That means the way you interact with your students, the way you interact with one another, and we can't do, we're not going to become the University of Phoenix. Well, you're not here. Tech is about people. And so we have to be available. We have to be accessible. And I don't want the staff to feel like the faculty don't have that same obligation. And the facts show that you're doing a tremendous job of teaching, of carrying on your scholarship and research. And I told the staff, when we can have a face-to-face -face meeting and we can actually be talking back and forth, that would be a better time to address this. The thing about those town halls, and there's one for the faculty tomorrow, you submit questions, we answer them, there's no feedback, that's easy. It's when we engage one another that we have the more difficult conversations. But um, um, I know everybody has different levels of anxiety and risk, but we have to look at this as working together, knowing that people will respond differently and respecting the way they do. Um, let me close with oh, one thing I was about finances. <clears throat> um, a faculty member came by my house last week. They do that quite a bit. <laughs> they just show up. The, they may say, hey, here's a bag of apricots. Now, can I ask you a question? Or here's some jam. Why are you doing this? <laughs> uh, and I don't mind it one bit. But he said, oh, what is this talk about um, furloughing, financial exigency, and elimination of tenure. And my response to him was, what in the hell are you talking about? We have never talked, about, we have a plan for financial exigency, but I talked to the provost yesterday, we've never discussed that centrally. That's never been on our radar. Um, we have not furloughed. It actually doesn't make sense financially in Texas. And we have not cut salaries, and we don't intend to. Now, why, why can we do that, at least to this point? Um, I, 
I did an interview earlier this week along with the CFO, Noel Sloan, who's done an amazing job doing these last few weeks. And they wanted to talk about how was it that you cut the fees to students and provided some relief and other financial costs. Just eliminating the online distance education fee this fall will cost us $10.6 million. When we gave back the prorated dining and um, housing last, that was $11 million. So we've uh, foregone revenue, additional cost, it's around $55 million. What we had to give back to the state was another 20. We asked the, we asked the departments and colleges as part of the state cuts to cut 3%. That contributed about 7 million. Centrally, we had, we had dealt with the other part, through some efficiencies, some reorganization of certain programs, uh, suspending certain capital um, improvement projects. But we are fine, and the reason we are fine is because of what the faculty are doing in terms of generating student credit hours. We were up considerably last year. That makes a tremendous difference. Recently, Moody's released their new rankings of universities. Uh, you know, we have a ranking that, uh, that speaks to our financial stability. Texas Tech is in the top 20 in the nation. Well, we're double A plus stable. What that meant for us is when we issued bonds just recently, we were able to save $10 million in debt service. So Texas Tech is on very stable ground. It's because of our growth, our planning, our productivity, and that helps us offset these issues. Now, if this goes on for another year, the situation may become more dire. But if you hear those stories that there's talk of furloughs, cutting salaries, no, we're not there yet. And I don't think we're going to be. We have a very sizable reserve we haven't touched. And so um, the university is on very stable and uh, solid ground financially in spite of these extraordinary circumstances. Um, I think I've blabbed on long enough. I didn't mean to talk so much. Um, uh, I hope, oh, yeah, one last thing. When I talk about stability, this is some of the amazing things that are going on. I just, every morning I get a report on giving. Um, our goal this year was to raise $100 million. We, we, we never want to drop below that. So since I've been in this office, we've raised about $450 million through uh, giving, philanthropy. This year, we're right at $97 million. Think about that. With all of the difficulties people are dealing with in businesses, our alumni have stepped up and contributed nearly $100 million. And I think that says something about the kind of community you're joining. People love this school. And it's because of their experience here, and you have a profound effect on shaping that experience. So um, I look forward um, to meeting you. Uh, yesterday I sat do a virtual welcoming event in human sciences. I, I, I stayed on for the whole 45 minutes because it was so refreshing. They were introducing the new faculty and there's such a positive atmosphere in that college. I hope you find that in your college and I believe you will. You have the wonderful colleagues here, seek them out, find somebody who's gonna mentor you. Some of you are more senior, you may not need that, but for the young, there are many, many people here who can help you succeed. And with that, in the few minutes I have left, I'd be glad to take any questions. <laughs> okay. Hey, it's great to have you here. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. It's my privilege now to welcome Dr. Michael Gallion to the podium. Dr. Gallion is our provost. Would you join me in welcoming him? Good morning. Thank you, Suzanne. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, this uh, driving over to this side of campus always reminds me that how much I enjoy this side of campus. Uh, the museum is a wonderful place. If you're new to Texas Tech, which most of you are, I assume, uh, take some time to come over and uh, 
course, it's not open right now. <laughs> but uh, pretty soon we'll have the museum back open. The Ranching Heritage Center just down the road is a wonderful facility as well. A uh, great place to spend an afternoon when it cools down a little bit and you can walk the outside tour at the, uh, at the Ranching Heritage Center. The museum has some wonderful exhibits. And my wife and I are fans of things Native American, particularly uh, Southwestern uh, Pueblos, and the Navajo Nation, and, and uh, there's an incredible uh, Native American pottery collection in the museum here that I, I'm sure you would enjoy. So just hired a new director, Dr. Aaron Pan, who I think is going to do a great job for us. And, and then the International Cultural Center, which you might have driven by, is uh, also a uh, one of my favorite places on campus. They always have some wonderful art exhibits and uh, it's a great place where we celebrate the internationalization of our campus and the role of, uh, of our international students. So it, it's always nice to come over this side of the campus. I don't get here often enough. Uh, we appreciate you being here today and we appreciate you being part of Texas Tech University. How many of you are first time academic position people? Most of you, okay. That's kind of what I assume. That's usually the case. Uh, some of you may have had experience at other places, but most of you are probably somewhere along the continuum of, of uh, faculty success, so to speak, in terms of what your rank might be or uh, what you still need to do in your career to be considered successful by whatever standard you want to choose. Um, I guess about 43 years ago, I was in the same place you were. Uh, not exactly. I was in New Mexico at New Mexico State, which is actually where I did my bachelor's degree, went to graduate school, and came back to a, a faculty position. We didn't have a TLPDC uh, at that time, and uh, you're fortunate to have that. It's a wonderful organization, a wonderful resource for faculty members, and I always appreciate the fact that they do this new faculty orientation. But what we had at New Mexico State when I started was a reception with the president. Uh, at the Student Union Ballroom, basically the Corbett Center at New Mexico State. Uh, and my wife and I went to that and, you know, did our duty in shaking hands with the president and ate the appropriate cookies or whatever it was we had at the time. Sorry, you don't get any food today. They, they wanted to do that and I nixed it, so it's my fault. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I always look back on that experience very fondly uh, it, because beginnings are always neat things. And, and so I think, I hope you will look at your experience at Texas Tech in the same way. Uh, I've been here for 22 years now. I think that's right. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of changes in those 22 years. I came here in January of 1998. And uh, it, it's just been amazing how many changes physically, the changes that we've seen in campus buildings and the expansion of our facilities uh, has been remarkable. Uh, the investments that we've made, particularly in the research arena, uh, have been very significant. I came here mostly with a focus on research, so uh, it's been a great place for me to uh, be involved in my own career uh, until I made the switch in 2011 to an administrative component. Still try to do some research and some science on occasion, but uh, in fact, I was working on that a little bit yesterday, so uh, even though you may get sidetracked with silly things like administration in your own careers. Don't, don't give up on doing the things that are really important to you, like your research, your scholarship. Um, but one thing that has remained consistent in those 22 years is this has been a great place to work. Uh, I've, often told, uh, I've often told people, and uh, I'm sure some of the folks that are with TOPDC have heard me say more often than they like, perhaps, that this is the best place I've worked. I've worked at three institutions, and this is by far the way the, the, the best place. One of those being New Mexico State. I worked there for 19 years. That's where I got my degree. That's my home. But I think Texas Tech has been the best place I've ever worked. It's been a great place to work with great people, and I think you'll find it that way. And I think that's one of our, our truth strengths. And uh, it's something that I'm proud over the 22 years that I've been here has not changed. In the Office of the Provost, we focus basically on two things, in my opinion, uh, and that's student success. The president mentioned some things we're very proud of in terms of student success. We will this year, I believe, set a record for first-year retention. 
uh, we, we are very close and I think we'll probably make our 2025 goal if we're certainly actually a little beyond where we should be to be on track. Uh, our first year retention rate for 2025, our goal is 90% and we're getting close enough that I think we'll make that. Our graduation rate is increasing. As the president said, it's not quite where we'd like it to be. We'd like it to be 70% by 2025. We're going to have to work hard to get there. Uh, but uh, we have made tremendous strides in student success. And as we look at our, our second, third, and fourth year retention rates, fourth year graduation rate, uh, those metrics are all going in the direction we would hope for and going rapidly in those directions. That doesn't happen without faculty doing a remarkable job. So uh, that's been a major part of our success. We have great teams working on that and focusing on contacting students and making sure students get re-enrolled and advised properly and all those things are part of it. But at the end of the day, it is faculty involvement that really makes the difference, I think, in student success. The second thing we focus on in my office is faculty success. That's my favorite part, actually. And it, and it probably takes as much of my time as anything. We've got wonderful people who worry about the student success piece. And, and uh, in many ways, unfortunately, I didn't, don't get to spend as much time on that end of the business as I might like to. But we do focus quite a bit on faculty success, and I've tried to make that uh, certainly uh, a real key element of my role in the provost office. That's things like promotion and tenure. That's things like awards that we give to faculty. That's things like the Faculty Success Task Force, which we started a couple of years ago, to try to really look in depth at the ways in which we can improve the success of Texas Tech faculty members. Uh, and I think we've had some, some great strides because of that. Uh, some of them very simple things. For example, last year we started a department chairs, school directors, area coordinators, depending on what college you're in, uh, but a chairs academy is what we refer to it as, or a chairs council. Uh, we hadn't done that before. And people who go into the department chair role oftentimes go in without any real training uh, and without any real understanding of a lot of the uh, administrative components of the university that, that are very important to their success and ultimately then to faculty success. Uh, so we've tried to be much more intentional about giving department chairs information that it can help you as a faculty member. So those are the things that, that we really try to focus on in the office. My, I'm supposed to talk today about your role at Texas Tech. And I think your role at Texas Tech relates to that faculty success piece. We want you to succeed. That's really your role at Texas Tech. Uh, that is, to me, the most important thing. When I was a dean and we were hiring people, I would always tell faculty members, look, you know, we're not hiring you because we want you to fail six years from now. We're hiring you because we want you to succeed. And we're going to do everything within our power to help you do that. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do in the Office of the Provost. In the promotion and tenure process, which is certainly a big part of that success thing, um, we focus, obviously, as I think you know, on three things, teaching, research, and service. Uh, service, outreach, depending on what you want to call it. Um, and, and those are really, if you, you know, so that's kind of nice to know. I need to worry about three things, right? So now that, that's overstating, that's being too simple, because there's obviously a lot more to those three things than just, you know, remember those th three things. But that actually is a pretty good mantra to have, you know, that, that these are the three things I need to focus on and not lose sight of the fact that this is what I should be doing if I want to be successful. So start with teaching. The first thing I would tell you is that uh, in my own history, I probably considered for the most part when I started out as a faculty member, teaching is a necessary evil, right? Now, I hope you don't feel that way. Uh, I hope you're committed to teaching. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't try to do the best job that I could. I did, and, uh, but I really was always consumed with a passion for research. That was, that was why I went to graduate school. That was why I wanted to be in the academy, was because I wanted to do research. Uh, and I was able to do that, but along the way I discovered that teaching is really an important component of what we do, whether it's formal classroom teaching to undergraduates or individual teaching to graduate students, it's a really critical part of what we do. So I grew to like teaching, even though I initially started off with perhaps the same op uh, opinion of of, of teaching as my initial advisor, academic advisor in graduate school at Oklahoma State. He was definitely a person more focused on research than teaching. And, 
and his uh, statement was, don't ever repeat this to anybody, but he would say, well, you know, the university would be a wonderful place if it wasn't for all the students. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, I've learned that that was not a very good attitude to have. Um, because it is, you know, in fact, as a dean, what I learned really quickly was how important teaching is. In fact, teaching may very well be the most impactful thing that you do as a faculty member. Have you ever thought about the fact that, that uh, people who win Nobel Prizes probably had somebody in a classroom that started them down that path, that led them to that success that they had? You know, as I talk to alumni, they always went back to to their classroom setting and said, you know, Professor so-and-so, you know, this is the way he interacted with us, had such a great influence on my life. That was a story that I just kept on hearing. And you realize right away that, that what we do in the classroom is really vital to what a university is all about. And it really is the experience that probably will make the most effect uh, on what you accomplish in your career. Uh, we have a lot of ways for you to be successful. Not everybody's going to start out being a great teacher, but we have a lot of ways for you to be successful. TLPDC is a big one of those, uh, and I would encourage you to take advantage of the resources available there and the resources available in your own department with colleagues. The second piece of that success for promotion and tenure anyway is research and scholarship. Uh, it, it really is critical to your success. There's no doubt about it. You know, this is a three-way thing. You can't, you can't get there without playing in all three of those fields. And, and research and scholarship is a big piece of that. We expect you to be a scholar. We expect you to publish work. We expect you to educate students, or, uh, graduate students in particular, and help them complete graduate degrees. Uh, all of that being part of the research and scholarship process. And as I've watched people over the years that have not done as well in that arena, uh, I, I'll give you a couple of pieces of advice. I think the biggest thing that causes people to fail is they don't follow through. They start something and don't finish it. Right? I, I, now, I've always been fortunate, I think, in many respects, because the piece of research that I love the most is the end of it, right? I mean, I like planning the experiment. I kind of like you know, the, doing the experiments fine. I enjoy it, all those kind of things. But I just love the piece of analyzing the data, writing it up, sending it in the journal, doing the back and forth on the reviews. That's the fun part for me. It's maybe not the fun part for you, but it is a necessary part. You have to do it. You have to finish. And I think as I've seen people who haven't succeeded, uh, that's really a key issue. They just haven't forced themselves to finish. They put things off. They kicked it down the road. And that's what will ultimately get you in a tough spot. You don't have to do it all on your own. In fact, these days, partnering for success in research and scholarship is far more likely to benefit you than trying to be that you know, person on an island, uh, the great scientist who is successful in all of their own merits, not because, of they, co because they cooperated with someone else. Those days are pretty much gone. So partner with people partner for success, and I think that will definitely help you. We have great support from the Office of Vice President for Research and Innovation, uh, and I think they, uh, uh, they will help you find mentors. They will help you find, you know, if you need help in writing grants, if you, you, they're going to provide you with that kind of expertise. And we're doing more and more of that in the college level as well, so I think you'll, you'll find there are opportunities. Uh, and... In both teaching and research, find mentors. Now, I'm going to tell you that we don't do a great job of mentoring on campus, in my opinion. I think that's one of our things that we really need to work on. We need to make it more formal than it is. Uh, so it's probably incumbent upon you to find the mentors and to say, hey, I need some help. You know, find a faculty member who's been around, has been successful, and sit down in their office and say, hey, you know, I'd really like you to help me, guide me a little bit on this pathway and help me to be successful. And, I think your advice would, would be good for me. And so you're probably going to have to be the one who forges that relationship because everybody gets busy. Everybody, you know, they don't think about mentoring as a key part of what they do, unfortunately. We want to change that culture, but that's not where we are right now. So I would advise you to find people to uh, help you in that process and be your mentor. 
the final thing is service and outreach. And I would just say that, you know, the key thing for me is get involved in this community, the university community, whether it's service on committees in your department, in your college. Uh, you can go overboard on that, but it's certainly important for you to do that. You network that way. You, you learn a lot of things about how the university works. I would also say it's really key for you to do the same thing in your professional organizations. I, I was fortunate to get involved in my professional organization early on, mostly from an editorial standpoint. Eventually served as editor-in-chief, served on the board of directors, served as the president. And all of those things were just, you know, those are highlights of my career. It's that external piece to the university, but it's still part of your discipline area, and, and uh, it's a really neat part of your life if you allow it to be that. So. Uh, in that service and outreach area, I think those are good opportunities for you. But you know, you won't be successful if you can't be part of a community because that's what you've just done. You've hired on with us and now you're part of the Texas Tech community. More specifically, you're part of a college community, part of a department community, all the way down to a disciplinary community probably uh, if you've got multiple people in the same discipline that you're in. And I'll be honest with you, you're going to struggle if you don't figure out how to be part of that community that you're involved with in your department or your college. Uh, and, and so I'm going to give you some old guy advice, right? Uh, and that advice is that the really key thing to helping you be successful in that community is communication. You know that, right? We all know, I mean, 99% of the problems I deal with in my office, and there's some pretty ugly ones sometimes. It's all about communication. Ineffective communication is the cause of most every problem that we have on campus, quite frankly, when it comes to personnel issues. So I'll give you a couple of three points of, uh, related to communication in your department, in your college. First of all, be a listener, right? Don't talk too much. <laughs> I'm talking too much this morning, but uh, when you get old, you can do that. Um, be a listener, really. I, I think that's uh, it's so important. And whether that's listening to your students in the classroom or listening to colleagues who are trying to give you advice or listening to a faculty discussion in, in, a, in a department, uh, yes, you know, listen, think through it, and contribute, but be a listener first. Make sure you heard what the other people are saying. Uh, second thing that I've learned over the years, which uh, it, I think we all know, but we never practice is don't believe that you can read minds, right? Uh, now, you may say, well, everybody knows you can't read minds, but I'll guarantee you, you've probably said this very thing. You've, you've been offended by somebody and you've thought to yourself, well, I bet that person did that because, right? So you've just decided that you could read their mind and know why they did something, right? Uh, and don't, the other thing related to that is don't be easily offended. If you're looking to be offended, it's easy to get offended, right? Uh, you know, take things in stride uh, and, and don't think you can read minds because that usually le leads to offenses. Uh, go sit down in an office with somebody. If, if, if you've been offended, if you think somebody's done something that's wrong, wrong towards you in particular, Go sit down in the office face to face with that person with a mask on right now, six feet apart. Right? But, but, uh, but do that first. Don't send an email. Don't send a text. Don't post something on social media. Go over and talk to somebody. That is the best advice I can give you uh, in your career. I think it will help you as you move along. Uh, that kind of face to face communication can clear up a lot of problems. Uh, so focus on face-to-face -face communication and don't think you can know what somebody else is thinking. And finally, uh, universities are, uh, uh, people who I know outside the university often say, how do you put up with all those big egos? <laughs> because many of you people, I mean, most of us have advanced degrees, right? You probably all do. Uh, that's why we hired you. Uh, you've been successful. Uh, and along with that, there's a tendency for our egos to grow. Uh, keep your ego down as much as possible. Don't think, don't think more highly of yourself than you are. You're, you're really not anybody yet for the, most of you, right? You're just at the beginning. You're, you're still going to be somebody, right? But even when you get to be somebody, really not all that important, there's always somebody better than you, right? 
So don't, don't think too highly of yourself because that can be a big barrier to your success as well. Well, I have uh, preached, I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do hope that 43 years from now, as I look back on my uh, wife and I going to the student union ballroom to meet the president, uh, and always look at that very fondly. I hope 43 years from now you will think back to this experience with new faculty orientation. Think, yeah, you know, Texas Tech was a neat place. I hope you're still here 43 years from now. I don't think I'll be here 43 years from now. Uh, I, you know, if, if I'm still around 43 years from now, I'm sure going to be fishing somewhere. I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm not going to be here on campus. But, uh, but I hope you look back at this experience, whatever time it is from now that you. Uh, end your career uh, and think of it as a, a really neat start to what you did. Uh, and I hope we do things in this new faculty orientation that, that help you to be successful. And, and I would close simply by saying if you, uh, you know, we are available in the provost's office. Uh, there's, you know, we always say, well, I've got an open door policy and my door is almost always open actually. but. Uh, we really do. If you know, don't feel like you can't contact the office of the provost about something, or any office, the dean's office, in the colleges that you're in, the department chair, in the department you're in. Uh, it is that communication and being able to reach out to somebody that that can help clear up problems and help you be successful. So please feel free to contact us uh, if we can help you in any way. And again, welcome to Texas Tech. I know you're going to enjoy it here. Thank you very much. Okay, a few things before we transition to our break. These are unusual times, right? Um, the TLPDC has been so fortunate to host new faculty orientation for quite a few years. And typically, we would be doing some other things that we don't have an opportunity to do today. We shortened our agenda today to keep our time together, our proximity a little bit um, shorter for safety protocol. But I want you to know that typically we would have a panel of new faculty members who would be up here and would be able to tell you, this is what I did to help manage my time. This is what I did that protected me um, in my work-life balance. This is what I did in teaching that made a difference for me. Um, we will have that panel virtually in the coming weeks, but I wanted you to know that that's one thing we didn't get to do this time. Another thing that I'm really missing is a student panel. Um, we would have the opportunity to place students in front of you to say, I love it when my professors do this. Um, it's challenging when my faculty members do this. I really value the student voice. It's something that we would normally do. Again, we'll try to repeat that in a virtual component for you. Um, we would also have a lunch. We would feed you, I promise. <laughs> and we would invite your chairs to join us so that you could have an opportunity before the semester starts, perhaps to have a few one-on-one -on -one moments with your chairperson. Those are some things that we're missing sometimes. But what it also means is that from the front of the room, you're seeing a lot of faces that look the same. And I want to be transparent about that and tell you that is not by design. Normally, we would be much more representative and show different perspectives from the front of the room. The circumstances that we are in did not allow for that this time. So I want to call that out and tell you we would do things differently uh, normally in a normal year. So another thing I want to point out is that when you are in the classroom, you need to have an entrance and an exit strategy. If you have a room that has multiple entrances, they will likely have signs on the doors that tell you this is the entrance, this is the exit, right? We have pretty broad space here, so we felt like it was okay to enter the room from both sides and would actually have more congestion if we limited that. But you need to have a strategy, so we're going to do that right now and model this because we have a break for the next oh, 15 minutes or so. I hate this analogy, but I, I think it works a little bit. Um, it's kind of like a wedding or a funeral, right? We're going to exit from the back row by row. So we'll take a 15 minute break. There are some bottled drinks. Um, Walk outside if you need to, grab something to drink, um, social distance, and perhaps still initiate a little conversation with someone. Um, but we'll start our exit today from the back of the room, and we'll take a break. 
Okay, everybody when you walked in should have gotten a white folder um, with all the benefits information that I'm going to go through. So in the folder, in the, in the envelope, if you'll pull out this red folder, I'm going to be going through the information in this first. So as I walk through the slides, I will try and prompt you to the different locations where I am. So what you see on the slide is the Human Resources Office. This is where we're located. We are on campus. It is on the corner of what used to be 15th Street and, and University, but now it's just a really big parking lot. We do have visitor parking. If you need to drive over to see us, you shouldn't have any issues with parking. Uh-oh, sorry, I'm having technical difficulty here. Oh, there we go, super. So on the left side of your uh, red folder is a COBRA acknowledgement. If you would, please pull this packet out and sign and print your name on this. Rip that top sheet off and we're going to take those. You can either leave them in the auditorium and we will collect them later, or like Suzanne said, we'll be available afterwards and you can give them to us then. What this notice is, is just to let you know that even though you are just now getting onto the university's plan, that when, once you leave the university, you will be offered COBRA. On the same left-hand side, of your folder is a new employee benefits guide. It's a kind of a booklet. It has this picture on it. If you want to, if you pull that out, you will be able to follow along with my slides and make notes on different pages as we go through this so that if you have any questions, you can um, write them down on the pages where it might be pertinent. So the most often question that we get in our office is when am I eligible? So there's two different eligibility periods that we'll talk about. Health insurance, you are, your health insurance will be effective the first of the month following 60 days of employment. So most of you, I believe, have a September 1st hire date. Some of you are a little different, um, but if your September 1st is your hire date, October 31st is your 60th day, which means that your health insurance will be effective November 1st. There are a few exceptions to this wait period. If you happen to be transferring from another state of Texas entity or institution of higher education somewhere in Texas, please let us know. That way we can um, get you directly transferred. If there's not a break in service, then you won't, won't have that wait. Also, if you happen to be being carried as a dependent on someone else's plan that is a state of Texas employee, like if you are a spouse of a, somebody who's already a professor or a staff member and they've been carrying you as a dependent, please let us know because you will have, certain, you will have um, a certain time frame to get moved on to your own plan. And when we look at the rates, you'll understand why you want to be on your own plan um, instead of being carrying, carried as a dependent. Um, for the health insurance, you'll be offered two different options. One is a point of service option. The other one is a high deductible health plan. The first plan, health plan we're going to talk about is Health Select of Texas. Both health plans that the state of Texas offers are self-funded and administered by ERS, which is the Employees Retirement System of Texas, and they both participate in the Blue Cross Blue Shield network. So you can see here on the screen, there are columns for network and non-network. Network means that you are utilizing Blue Cross Blue Shield doctors you are receiving those negotiated rates that the insurance and ERS have um, created for you. You see there's no annual deductible. Uh, primary care visits are 25, specialist office visits are 40. The out-of-pocket coinsurance, what that is, is if you go to the doctor and do anything beyond an office visit, that is when the coinsurance comes into play. And that's where you see the $2,000 right there. Also, in your folder, there's a more in-depth um, handout 
that looks like this. It kind of has the little grid that we've got up here, but this will give you more in-depth information on kind of what your co-pays will be and out-of-pockets and that information. Um, preventive care is covered 100%, and you do have um, out-of-pocket maximums for, for network visits. And what that means is it's kind of a stop once you have, if you have a, catast a catastrophic event and you have a large medical bill, that it will be capped at, one, at, at a certain point as long as you're using network doctors. So you can kind of see that using those network doctors is very important because what that's going to do is it's going to minimize your out-of-pocket costs. So the Health Selective Texas functions with a primary care physician referral system which means that you have to designate a primary care physician. Everyone in your family that you plan to cover under this plan has to have one. You do not have to have the same one, but you have to pick one. And then they have to give you referrals if you need to go to a specialist. So all of the forms that I'm going to be showing you are on the right-hand side of your folder. This is the primary care physician um, selection form and it it's called supplemental information form don't know why but that's what that is stands for um, you're going to put your information at the top there's a space at the bottom for you to enter any dependents you might be covering and select um, a PCP on the form this form goes directly to health select which is Blue Cross Blue Shield the address is on the back of the form where that needs to be mailed it is important that you designate a primary care physician because if you do not, your claims will be processed on that non-network basis. You saw that column, you're gonna be paying more out of pocket until you get a primary care physician designated. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Network um, website. It is healthselectoftexas.com. In the book that you have, not the very last page, I think the very last page is like a disclaimer, but right inside the very next to the last page are all of the websites that you will see in my presentation, as well as 800 numbers where you can contact any of these vendors. But you can always get to any of the benefit information from the ERS website. <clears throat> and we've highlighted here where you can go and find a provider. And I believe if you go to this website, it will tell you when you click on certain providers if they are accepting new patients. So that's something to consider as well. So here we are to the premiums. This is the important part. As you can see, the university pays 100% of employee only coverage and it will cover 50% for any dependent coverage that you choose. So this is why it's important if you're being covered as a dependent right now under someone else who is on this same plan that we move you over to your own health plan at least because then you get the benefit of the state paying 100% for your medical coverage as well as 100% for your spouse's medical coverage. And then if you're covering children, you just need to decide who wants to cover those children. You both cannot, it shouldn't, you don't wanna pay double, but we can help you work that out as well. Okay, so with the Health Select of Texas, there is a flexible spending account. It's called TexFlex. This is a tax-free account that lets you set money aside on a pre-tax basis from your check so that you can pay for those expenses that you know you're going to have with tax-free dollars. So we're gonna talk about another account that goes with a high deductible health plan but this TexFlex account goes with the Health Selective Texas plan, <clears throat> and it is to cover things like co-pays. We talked about the co-insurance earlier when we were talking about the Health Select um, prescription fees, any vision, hearing, or dental expenses that you might have as well can also be run through here. So the maximum contribution for this plan year is 2750 per, per participant. So when that is set, you pick an annual amount and then you divide that by the number of paychecks you're going to have in the year and that's what your amount will be coming out of your paycheck. This, since it goes with your health plan, also starts 60 days 
um, you're on your 60th day, your first, the first of the month following 60 days of employment. Oh, I have one. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, with this, claims can also be submitted either via an online portal or there is a debit card option available to run like at the pharmacy or the doctor's office. It works just like your bank debit card will. Uh, important part about this is that um, it is it has a plan year like the school year. It starts September 1 and goes to August 31st. And what you set aside in one year, you have to use in that year. With the exception of a rollover, they, the rollover, if you, if you start using it and decide you want it this plan year, next August, as long as you have under $550, that will roll over into next plan year. But you want to make sure that you kind of look at your information and see, plan your expenses so that you don't have more than $550 left so that it will roll over into next year. Another nice thing about this account is if you choose to do the whole 2750 which is the maximum, the, when the first contribution comes from your paycheck, it will only really be a portion of the amount that you've selected, but the entire amount is available to you should you need it. And then it will just kind of, it'll, <clears throat> you will make the contributions to make up what you have pulled out throughout the year as your payroll gets processed. Now we're going to talk about the Consumer Directed Health Select Plan. <clears throat> this plan is a high deductible health plan. What that means is that there is a deductible that has to be met prior to the plan paying anything. So you can see here, the, there is still network and non-network, which means you are, when you're using those Blue Cross Blue Shield network doctors, you are getting those negotiated prices that go with our plan. You're just not going out there like you didn't have insurance and all and the doctor told you whatever, but you are getting negotiated right, rates. You can see everything is a percentage because it's going to go towards your deductible. There is no requirement to pick a primary care physician with the high deductible health plan, but like it, it shows, you're going to be paying that upfront cost uh, before the plan begins to pay anything. The uh, preventive costs are still covered 100%, and you can um, look and see what our preventive um, visits in the uh, website as well as the book that you have. So how a high deductible health plan works. If you are covered under an individual plan, you must pay $2,100 on any medical in-network visits. You're going to pay out of pocket for that before the plan pays. If you're covering family, it's going to be double, $4,200. The high deductible health plan considers you and a spouse as family. So there's not a designation. Um, for you and kids or whatever, if it's you plus one more, it's going to be you and it's going to be family coverage. It doesn't matter if it's a spouse or a child. So <clears throat> your plan will pay the coinsurance of 80%, you pay 20%, and there it is listed that the preventive costs are paid 100%, and the same out of pocket are listed there as well. And you can see that it looks like everything doubles whenever you do not utilize out of um, in-network Blue Cross Blue Shield doctors. So how do you fund the HUD, the deductible piece? So you will be, <clears throat> you'll need to set up a health savings account, which is what we kind of talked about. It's different than the TexFlex because a health savings account is an individual account that you set up individually. It um, will grow tax-free some um, once you have certain balances you are allowed to invest them with that um, bank <clears throat> other things you need to consider is this money carries over from year to year to year there's not the limit like there is on the TexFlex that 550 on the TexFlex does not apply here any money you have in your health savings account at the end of the year belongs to you the 
um, because this is attached to that high deductible health plan and the deductible runs from January to December, your contributions are also, that's the plan year for your health savings account. And the, the money goes with you should you decide to change employers, change jobs, whatever, that money is yours always and forever. So the state does contribute money to your account if depending on the level that you enroll in if it is individual you will get forty five dollars a month into that health savings account for you to have to use how you see fit if you are on a family plan it will be ninety dollars into that account for you to use here we've got the maximums for the year and these are on uh, full calendar years so you guys would not be able to um, reach the maximum this year because of the late entry of November 1 into the plan okay but if you do want to choose a health savings account that second or a, the high deductible health plan that second step is to enroll in a health savings account so that you do get your contributions from the state no. Optum Bank is the provider that we use for um, the health savings accounts so this there's also a link to this whenever we, t we start talking about enrollment um, we'll get to that but this is kind of where you're going to access that and here are the premiums for the consumer directed as you can see the state still pays 100 percent of your uh, employee only premium and they still pr contribute 50 percent on any dependents that you cover and so this is on top of what they're going to give you into your health savings account. Prescription drug coverage. So we have combined this because both plans, the Health Selective Texas and Consumer Directed, use the Optum RX prescription plan. The difference is that the high deductible health plan, you have to meet your deductible with, uh, before you start, before the plan will start to pay. On the health select side, you can see there is a $50 individual deductible, and that's per individual that you're covering on your medical plan. If you don't have medical insurance, you will not have prescription drug coverage either. So the health select, there are um, network and non-network, and if you're doing non-maintenance or maintenance medications, there's different tiers and different co-pays per tier. If, um, the non-maintenance drugs are going to be like if you have a cold and you go to the doctor and they give you antibiotics, you're going to take that once and move on. Your maintenance medications are going to be something that you take on a regular basis, such as thyroid or high blood pressure. So you can see those different kinds of uh, co-pays there. And then with this, like the medical insurance, if you're on that high deductible plan, you, st you still get the benefit of being on an insurance because you're going to get that negotiated rate with the plan. There is extended day supply. As you can see, you can save some money if you happen to be on a tier three drug on getting an extended day and they have mail order as well. <coughs> so to help you out, to make a, to look at some of your drugs, if you're not sure what tier, what level your drugs might be covered at, there is a pricing tool at OptumRx. The website is listed here. Like I stated before, it is also in the back of your book. You can mark that if you have some interest in looking at that. Also, oh, golly gee. Here we go, sorry about that. On the Health Selective Texas website, there is a health comparison tool which when you go to Health Selective Texas, you wanna look at, click on the Consumer Directed Health Select. It will take you through the process of kind of comparing the difference between Health Select, that is a point of service, with the high deductible health plan. And because only you know what your individual situations are with your family and what kind of medical needs you might have, it can guide you through helping, uh, helping you make a good decision. Also, no matter which plan you decide to participate in, you have two options for virtual visits. There is a doctor on demand as well as MD Live. I'm not sure why there's two different ones, but they are both there um, for your utilization. 
And here are some things that you could do your doctor on demand for. In your folder on the right hand side, there's a whole flyer with this information, so don't feel like you gotta write it all down or anything. Um, and it is 24 seven access. So if it's, um, I know when my daughter was small, it's always the middle of the night when they're sick. So you can call them up and they can maybe tell you if you need to go to the ER or maybe if you can wait till the pediatrician opens the next morning. So our coverage does include dependents in <clears throat> For our medical, dental, and vision, um, and some other products we'll talk about in a moment, as long as you are covered, you can cover your dependents um, up to age 26. Um, and like it states, you must be enrolled in the coverage in order to cover your employee, or your dependent, sorry. You can't put your kids on the vision and the dental if you don't take it. Okay, very, very important step. So once you get all signed up, we'll talk about that at the end, there are two parts that you need to go through for your dependents. If you're covering dependents, please make sure you're listening. You have to go through a certification process, either when you fill out the um, enrollment form for us or do it online. Then after the fact, a company called All Light Solutions is going to mail a packet to your home. They're going to request information on any dependent you added to your health plan. So they're going to either want marriage license, birth certificates, um, those types of things. They will give you a whole list of information of things they will take. This information is, will be sent to the address that you listed on your W-4 when you were hired. That's the address we use when we enter you into the health system. So if you have a change, um, if you can't get to that address anymore and you haven't provided human resources with an updated address, please do that. You can email it to um, the address on the card that's um, in the front of your envelope. We can get that taken care of for you. But this is a very important step because if you miss this, ERS will drop your dependents off of the plan completely. And there isn't anything that me, anybody in my area, anybody on this campus can do. You'll have to wait till next year's annual enrollment at July, in July to get them back on the plan. Okay. So here is a what if, we get this sometimes, what if I need uh, to access benefits if I don't have my ID card? Because um, it's pretty close to your 60th day when Blue Cross Blue Shield will mail out your cards um, this group number for Blue Cross Blue Shield is listed in the back with the tools on your, uh, in the guide you have, but the OptumRx, the group number is not. So if you want to take a minute and jot that down, you can, because as long as your coverage is effective, which is most of you is going to be November 1st, even if you don't have a card, your doctor or the pharmacy can call the 1-800 the, uh, numbers with the group and your social and verify that you do have coverage and you can get all that, okay? So what if you opt out? So our insurance plan is set up cafeteria style, which means you get to pick and choose which benefits you want. We just don't automatically give you all of it. The only thing that we do, um, do automatically is um, all new hires are enrolled in um, employee only health select of texas plan and if you want to add dependents or do anything other than that you'll have to take action so if you do not want our health insurance and because you have other coverage whatever that might be you can get an opt-out credit <clears throat> for full-time employees it is sixty dollars part-time employees it happens to be thirty i don't think anybody in here is part-time though but that can only be utilized to purchase dental, vision, and accidental death and dismemberment insurance that we're gonna talk about here in just a second. It's just not $60 that they're gonna add on to your check, okay? Um, then you should also consider the, you will not get any prescription drug coverage if you opt out of the medical, and you will lose the $5,000 basic life policy that comes with the health plan. 
Another very important action that's required of all new hires, uh, unfortunately, the state of Texas thinks we're all tobacco users. So you have to get in and either mark it on your, L your enrollment form, going to choose to enroll in paper, or when you go online, you'll have the option to select it. You must designate everyone, even newborn babies have to say they do not use tobacco. So um, if you do not designate that, um, the state will charge you a $30 surcharge per adult um, until you designate your tobacco certification. Um, and then as of September 1st, they have deemed that electronic cigarettes and vaping is tobacco use. So you should um, answer, or answer that question accordingly, however it pertains to you, any tobacco use, cigarettes, vaping, um, because if they find out that you did not answer it appropriately, they can ban you from the state of Texas plan for the remainder of your employment. Okay, so as to recap, there are two different health plans to choose from, Point of Service Health Select of Texas and then Consumer Directed Health Select, which is the high deductible health plan. We do keep, have employee and dependent coverage. Watch your mail for that dependent certification verification process if you're enrolling dependents. And then the TexFlex and the health savings accounts are two completely different accounts, and depending on which health plan you select, will dictate which one of those that you can participate in. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about all of the other additional products, our dental and vision, those types of things. These you must enroll within the first 31 days and they'll be, they will start the beginning of the following month. So. If you are September 1st hires, that designation has to be made in the month of September. Your coverage will be effective October 1st. If you happen to have been an August 1st or between August 1st and now hire, if your hire date sometime in August, if you will make the designation for your uh, products that we're about to talk about, the dental and the vision and all of that, prior to September 1st, they will be effective September 1st but you do have the 31 days to make the designation. You were hired August 16th, you have until September 16th to make that designation. The state has two dental insurance plans. There is a Delta Care Dental HMO and the State of Texas Dental Choice Plan. The dental HMO works just like a medical HMO. You have to designate a primary care dentist you have to see that dentist for care or the plan won't pay. The State of Texas Dental Choice Plan, you can see there is network and non-network dentists, works very, very much like a medical uh, network and non-network as well. If you go to see and utilize doctors in the network, you will have smaller out-of-pocket costs. This is what the Delta Dental website looks like. All of the dentists are listed for both plans, for the HMO or the State of Texas Dental Choice Plan. And here are the premiums for that plan. Now, I caution you, do not choose dental insurance on the premium. I know those dental HMO premiums look really good, but the uh, size of the network that's available to you is going to directly correlate to the size of that premium. So there are very few, I think there are seven providers that participate in that dental HMO plan and I can't guarantee the time frame in which you might be able to get into those dentists. So before you make a decision, if you're interested in dental insurance, please go out to the website and do some research. The doctors that are listed there, you might even pick up the phone and ask them uh, what their wait time is and if they're accepting new patients um, because that's, I'm sure, always a revolving door. The state of Texas does offer a standalone vision plan. So if you do not wear, don't need any assistance with glasses or contacts, your health plan will pay for one annual eye exam at a specialty office visit copay, 
But if you're like me and you need glasses, then this plan offers that help that you want to help pay for glasses um, because they're not cheap. It will, um, you can choose a $200 allowance for frames or contacts. You have to choose whichever one you want to use. And then there are co-pays for network doctors as well. Here are the premiums for the state of Texas plan. It is very affordable for um, a family, for family coverage. Um, I do cover my family and I see a great benefit from it. Um, the website that's listed here, you can go out and find the network of doctors. I haven't had any issues um, in Lubbock finding people that do take our insurance. You have options for life insurance. You'll have the option to um, add Add yourself to some and then we have some dependent coverage as well. The optional term life with a maximum up to four times your annual salary is for employee only. So the um, election here is going to depend on your salary and your age. It is a five-year term policy. So right now is your initial what we call initial eligibility window where no E of I is required for one or two times your annual salary. E of I is evidence of insurability. What that means is the insurance company gets to ask you some health questions and then they get to decide if they want to provide you the insurance or not. So you won't have to go through that for one or two times your annual salary, but you will always have to do it for three or four. And then if you choose not to take this product now and want to enroll next year, maybe during annual enrollment, you are going to have to go through that annual, um, the E of I process and the insurance gets to decide. The dependent life coverage is $1.38 for all dependents that you have. It doesn't matter if you have one kid or five or just a spouse, whatever. The $1.38 covers and provides you with a $5,000 um, term life policy. Voluntary accidental death and dismemberment. This is just another product to offer you some financial security should an accident or something happen. It is employee or employee and family. So like with the high deductible health plan, you with any other member of your family, whether it be a child or a spouse, will be family. You can pick coverage anywhere from 10,000 up to $200,000 and um, the coverage is very affordable. We also have short and long-term disability products. This, um, these are, I'm sure you've seen the commercial for Aflac, um, the duck. This is not through Aflac, it's through the state of Texas, through um, Reed Group, I think is the people that, um, take, or that um, administer this plan. They are meant to work together, but you do not have to have both of them. Um, the short-term disability has a 30-day elimination period which means you must be on um, not working for 30 days before the plan will start to pay. We'll pay for a maximum of five months. Then the long-term disability has a 180-day elimination period, which if you have the short-term disability, your 30 days of being off work plus your five months being paid on the short-term, you feasibly could move from short-term to long-term disability in the case of a catastrophic event. These products also are guaranteed insurability during your initial eligibility window, which is right now, your first 30 days. You will not have to go through evidence of insurability, like the life insurance we just talked about. If you wait until annual enrollment next year, you will have to go through evidence of insurability and the insurance company um, gets to tell you no if they want to. There is another TexFlex account available to you for dependent care. So if you happen to be paying for child care for someone who's under the age of 13, we all know that that's uh, sometimes not even affordable. It's expensive. This is um, a, an option to allow you to set money aside from your paycheck on a pre-tax basis so that you can pay for those expenses you know you're going to have with pre-tax dollars. And it is eligible for those under the age of 13. 
And if you happen to be caring for an adult who's a qualified dependent, there is a process for that, additional forms and all that. So if that happens to be your unique situation, let us know and we can direct you to how to get that taken care of. So this is just an example of kind of how TexFlex works. And um, I've talked about the tax advantage and you're paying for items with tax-free dollars. So this is very simplistic and it's for only illustration purposes only, so don't, don't take this to heart or think this is you. But so if this person that enrolled in TexFlex is going to put $4,800 into, into the dependent care and $600 into the TexFlex health care, you can see that it comes directly off of that taxable salary line. The person enrolled is only going to be taxed on 33061 and the person who didn't enroll is going to be taxed on 38461 which means the person that enrolled feasibly could save $1,113 in taxes. So the overview on the dependent care, it is $5,000 per household and it will come out of your check like either one of the medicals. You'll set an annual amount, they'll divide it by the number of paychecks you have, and that will be split equally through the months you have. There's not a debit card available for this plan. You'll have to create an online account and submit receipts directly to Reed Group <coughs> WageWorks, excuse me, so that you can get reimbursement. So with this plan, you have to wait until the funds have been taken from your payroll and placed into the account before you can utilize them. The entire amount is not available to you like it is on the Medical TexFlex side. That is a big difference. So to recap, there are two dental plans available to you to choose from. Remember, you have guaranteed insurability if you are interested in the life insurance, short or long-term disability during your initial eligibility, and then the pre-tax deductions from payroll on the TexFlex will save you for those federal dollars. Okay, so a little bit about enrollment. In your packet, you do have a paper form. We supplied it to everyone um, so that you can go ahead and get that done and get started if you want to paper enroll. Um, the online system that the state of Texas has will not be available to you until 9-1. So if you want to do that, there are also, I'll come back to that, there are also instructions that look just like this with screenshots in your packet. So if you want to wait till after September 1st so you can get it all done, do it all online yourself, that's completely fine you can create an account here. If you are going to paper in, we have brought some dependent child form certification forms with us to go with that paper form. So if you're gonna add children as dependents, please see us later and we'll give you as many as you have. You have to have one per child that you're covering to go with that paper form. And then they can be emailed or brought over to our office, um, however you wanna deliver them to us. Oh. So in your packet, like I said, these instructions, this is what the ERS website will look like. You'll want to register as a new user. It's going to ask you for Social Security date of birth and address. And as I mentioned before, we use the address you listed on your W-4. So if you've moved or don't know what that, ad don't remember what that address is, please let us know. You can email the Employee Services Center right there at that email address, or if it's from the hours of eight to five, please pick up the phone. If you get an error, because most of the time we can get in on the backside and see if we um, fat fingered a number, because that happens, unfortunately. You're going to click on post hire change if you're online to make all of your elections. We do ask that when you're in the online system, do not do your tobacco certification first. For some reason, the way the system is set up, if you do that tobacco certification first, it is gonna lock you out of the system. And then you're going to have to contact ERS directly to get everything set up in there. If you'll go through and look at the selections for medical and dental and make all of those selections first, then go back and do your tobacco, it will all flow seamlessly. 
All right, we will leave time later for questions because we're going to stick around. We're going to move over to retirement options. So in the envelope you received, there should be some, a packet of papers that uh, the yellow sheet is on top. This is the information that I'll be going through right now. <clears throat> so as full-time faculty, you will have the option of two retirement plans. The Teachers Retirement System of Texas, this is a defined benefit plan, it is the default. Everybody that comes through our office is automatically enrolled with TRS contributions. The optional retirement plan is a defined contribution plan that you have the option to elect in lieu of TRS. So a little bit about each plan. The Teachers Retirement System is a defined benefit plan in which the investment risk is all absorbed by the state. The funds are taken from the employee's check as well as the state contribution and deposited into a holding account in which the state hires professionals to invest those funds for a successful investment strategy. This is, um, you must retire through the system in order to receive the state contribution. What that means is you have to have a minimum of five years in TRS in order to qualify for an annuity once you reach retirement age. I know that's a lot. Um, so if you haven't ever been in higher ed or what, uh, the rules to retire, the, it's called the rule of 80. What that means is your age plus your years of service equal 80. That's the basic concept. And that would give you full, what we call full retirement. But should you not stay here until you're ready to retire, if you have five years contributing to this plan, once you leave, you can leave that money there. And then when you get retirement age, doesn't matter where you are, you do not have to even be living in the state of Texas or even the United States, you can call up TRS and say, hey, back in 2020, I know I had five years with you. I'm 65 now, I'm ready for my annuity. They will send you the paperwork and get you on your way, okay? Should you decide to pull your money out when you leave, you can. You can always take your money once you leave, but you will never be able to take out the state's portion that is contributed to TRS on your behalf. Um, these rates are subject to legislative change. I do believe um, the last legislative session, which was in 2019, rates were set really for the next four years. So legislation in Texas is on a biennium, which means we do it every two years. So you will, we will have all kinds of legislation going on from January to May of 2021. But um, unless something crazy happens, this shouldn't, um, there's changes in place, but it shouldn't be voted on in next legislative session because it's already been decided. The optional retirement plan. In your folder, there's a packet of paper that um, there's about three or four pages. That's the overview of TRS and ORP. You should read that. It gives you the pros and the cons of both plans. You can see here the, the contribution rates from the employees as well as the state are different. Like I said, those are set legislatively, not at the university level. So that's, that's what the legislatures in Texas have decided. The, um, this plan is an individual defined contribution plan, which means that you as the employee are in responsible for any investment choices that need to be made with this plan in order to create the investment um, prospect and stability. The university has nine vendors that we use in order to help you with that process. We don't expect you to do it all on your own, but there are nine companies that participate in our plan so that you can contact them and get a sort of some of them most of them have certified financial planners that can help you with that retirement process so that you can plan um, and have a good strategy for your funds um, you do have 90 days from your date of hire to choose between the two plans this is a one-time irrevocable choice so if you don't make it You'll be, stuck, you'll, you'll be stuck in the TRS plan for the remainder of your employment 
in the state of Texas. So that very first page that is bright yellow, we wanted to bring your attention to it. Um, it we have the September through November 30th date because uh, that probably is what applies to most of you. If you would, it would, be, it would help us out tremendously if you would fill out that bottom part and leave it with us um, when y'all come out this after, uh, after the two more presenters. Um, especially paying attention to number seven there. If you have worked at a higher education institution in the state of Texas, we need to know. Because if for some reason you have already been offered ORP at another institution and you didn't take it, you can't take it now. And then on the flip side of that, if you worked at another higher education institution and you opted to take ORP at that institution, you must also take ORP here as well. That will just help us kind of with the process of getting you in the right plan and no confusion. But until you make the designation, if this is your first time in the state of Texas or um, higher education, until you make that designation, you will continue you will be defaulted into TRS, so you will make contributions. Um, the vesting for the ORP plan is a year and a day, which means you have to work um, an entire school year and into the next one in order to be vested. It does have a true vesting like you would see with a 401k plan, which means that once you've met that vesting period, any money you've put in, as well as that percentage you saw that the state is gonna put in on your behalf, is yours to take with you. So you, once you terminate employment, you can pull those funds out and do whatever you want with them. Okay. If you are really gung-ho for retirement or you are at that point where you can put more money aside for retirement, there is a supplemental retirement plan. It's a tax-deferred account. It's a 403B plan. This plan is to let you set um, money aside additionally from your paycheck. You can do it either pre-tax or Roth. Roth investments are gonna be those that grow, that you pay after tax, and they still grow tax exempt. Um, this one, you can enroll at any time during the year. So this is one thing that you definitely don't necessarily have to make a decision on right now. There's no rush. So whatever, whenever you go into the plan, it will be effective the following payroll after that. Then the state of Texas also offers another um, additional retirement plan. It is called a Texas Saver 457 plan. This one is slightly different than the 403B plan. Some of the withdrawals are different and the penalties. So should you be considering additional retirement other than your ORP and your TRS, should definitely take a look at these two plans so that you can uh, decide which one better meets your needs. Both plans do have what's called a catch-up provision. So if you're over the age of 50, you can contribute more um, towards the IRS limit on either a 403B or a 457 plan. Then to recap on the participation in retirement, is it, it is a condition of employment. Everybody will contribute to retirement. Um, whichever plan you choose is up to you, keeping in mind your time frames. Uh, TRS is the default. Um, after that 90th day, you will not be able to make the selection. So if, if you happen to be one of those people that was hired maybe the first part of August or August 1st, you probably got an email from a benefits advisor saying that what your time frame was and should have attached one of those acknowledgements. So hopefully you've been in contact with someone about that. Um, supplemental retirement plans are optional. With those optional plans, the university does not put any money into those accounts. Those are completely and 100% funded by the employee. Then lastly, in your folder on the right hand side, I think it's the very last paper, there is a salary spread. Those of you who are hired on a nine month contract, if you would like to spread your salary over the 12 months to include next summer, you need to fill this out. We will happily take it for you when you, um, at, since we're going to stay, you can fill that out and bring it to us. We'll get that processed. 
You can only make this designation during the month of September for your employment. So if you don't make it now, you won't be able to make it again until next September. Okay, and I think that is it. A couple of recap question or re recap deals. Um, remember, first 31 days for all your products except for health. You have 60 days to enroll your dependents in health coverage. Pick a PCP. Uh, you want to sign up for the electronic notifications from ERS and TRS if you decide to go with that retirement route. The Employee Services Center is where Human Resources is located. This information right here um, is the best way to contact us. That email goes to six people, I believe, in our office, and we can get to you that way most quickly. Um, we are at our office. We're taking appointments. Um, people can come and visit. We've got our um, per, we've got plexiglass in front of our desks for personal space and to protect everybody. So if you need a one-on-one, -on -one, um, email us and let us know, and somebody will get you set up so that you can come to visit our office. All right. Okay, next on our agenda, um, Dr. Angela Lumpkin will be coming in the room. Okay. As Dr. Lumpkin makes her way in, let me just say that she wears many hats at our institution. Um, and in higher ed, Dr. Lumpkin is the chair of kinesiology and sports management. Uh, she is the chair of the teaching academy. Um, you might be able to guess that she was a coach in another life. She's been a dean, she's done all kinds of things. And she's here today to talk about my favorite thing, teaching. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Lumpkin? All right, <laughs> just to make sure. All right, my job is to tell you a little bit about the Teaching Academy first. And the Teaching Academy is the number one advocate for teaching on campus. And what I want you to hear me say right now is teaching really is important at Texas Tech. I repeat. Teaching really is important at Texas Tech. You have to do research if you're in a tenure track position and all of us do that, we, we understand the importance of that. But what's much more important is for you also to realize if you're a lousy teacher, we don't want you at Texas Tech. So the Teaching Academy is here to help you, not just to reward you, which we're going to do with membership hopefully in your career, but what we want to do is we want to tell you how to improve your practice of teaching. We're in this together with you, and we want to make sure that you understand that we're here to provide workshops, sessions. We're here to come evaluate your classes. We're, we're here to share good ideas. We are not the teaching police. We're the teaching advocates. Now, going along with the first day of teaching, the most, the most important day that you will meet with your students is the first day. You will set a lasting, you remember your mom telling you it, it's hard to, it, you have to make a first impression that first time you meet somebody. And if you mess it up the first time, it's not gonna work very well. So what I want you to understand is establishing the culture in a classroom from day one is what you wanna do. Being enthusiastic, being positive, we're under unprecedented times. We can all get through this together. That's one of the things that you're going to do in ses setting up the culture. Communicate, 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 communicate. Don't stop communicating with your students. Electronically is just fine. Face to face is just fine as long as you socially distance. Do not stop communicating. If any of you are teaching online, the most important thing you can do is communicate with your students. If you're teaching face to face, the most important thing you can do is communicate with your students. You've got to do that. It is your responsibility to set up a respectful, trustworthy relationship with your students. If you tell them something, follow up. If you mess up, Admit it. If you have something to correct, correct it. But communication is really important. You are the authority figure, and they expect you to tell them the truth. They expect you to be fair. They expect you to make sure that they understand everything that's happening in the class. And sorry, but at the end of the day, they want to know how you calculated that grade. So make sure that that clarity is coming through in that communication. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I pushed that the wrong direction. Oh, now we're just going great. This isn't like my remote. Sorry, it goes 
warp speed, kind of like the Marsha Sharp Freeway, so beware. All right, so the second thing I want you to do on the right is I want you to understand that there are some parameters that you need to set for your students. So in that case, tell them what your expectations are. Packing up, coming to class late, whatever those kind of things might be, set the expectations from day one in your syllabus, verbally, online, however you're going to deliver that message. But what you're going to do on that very first day of class is you're gonna set kind of the good, the bad, the ugly out there. You're going to make sure that they understand you're there for them and you also have expectations. And this is the way we're gonna run things in this particular class. How you run your class is maybe different than me, but the most important thing is that you set those parameters of what you expect your students to do. Wow, this is the fastest I've ever seen in my life. If you blow on it, it advances. I'm sorry about that. All right. Second piece of advice, other than the first day of class is the most important, is learn your students' names. If you're like me, you're lousy with names. Absolutely horrible. Learn them anyway. You can get a photo roster. Go on to Raider Link. You've heard of that somewhere before. On the right-hand side at the bottom, it'll say photo rosters. You open it up, and voila, there are pictures of your students. Print them off. Memorize them. If you don't like that approach, get a postcard. Have them send you a picture. Pop it on the postcard and start learning their names. If you wanted to take my method, which is I have little name tents, get some hard stock of paper, have them write their first names only. Those are the most important things for students. The most important thing in this person's life is their name. Learn it. And so learn your students' names, use your students' names, know your students by name, meet with them whenever you can, if it's virtually or face-to-face, -face. learn who the students are. They are not an R number. They're an individual person. Making a personal contact with a faculty member or a staff member or even a new friend within the first two weeks of college is the most important thing that will happen to an entering student. And a lot of you may find yourself with several of those early uh, to college students, and so learn their names. It's really important. See if I can do this one at a time. Care about your students, especially now. We're in the middle of a pandemic, surprise, surprise. But somebody used this, a word the other day that I thought was very appropriate. Some students are traumatized, either in their family situation, their personal life, someone that, that they love dearly has passed away. This is, this is a very unique time. Care about your students. You say, they will never know. Yes, they will. I was just reading evaluations of, of my faculty from the summer. I'm a department chair, Suzanne said. And the, this statement, and I, I won't read it to you, but the essence of it was, I have never in my life have, such a, have, have, had, have had such a caring teacher. You're what every student aspires to have as a teacher. Just let that soak in. Care about your students. And the other thing is, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, enjoy teaching. The best part of my day is getting to teach. Love what you do. Students will see your enthusiasm both for the content and learning them and will turn them on to it. Care about your students and care about teaching and it will show. Now to part three of my presentation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you five success ways that you can improve the teaching process and I'm gonna go pretty much warp speed because I have a limited amount of time. It will look some... <laughs> Suzanne, you need to slow this little thing down. Okay, it will look something like that. There is an entity called an Aristotelian trip stitch. I just learned this morning how to pronounce that. And basically it is one, three, and four. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. You laugh, that's good. Tell them what you're going to tell them. That is what happens when you go to class. And then tell them, and then before you leave, tell them what you told them. That's our part. We as teachers. Two and, f and Five are what the students do. You have to understand with today's students, the most important thing is what's in it for me. 
you have to make sure that everything that you do in relationship to your content, somehow or the other answers that question. If a student doesn't make a connection with your, what you're talking about, they have hit the road Jack or Sally, as the case might be. What's in it for me? What's the benefit to me? Make that connection. And let me tell you, that's, if I had any hands, I'd have a hook. But that's the hook that gets the students. All right. Go over to, to number five. All right, you convince them there's a benefit. Now, what use am I going to make? Maybe it's a prerequisite course to another course. Maybe it's something I'll use in my career later. What use can I make of what you're telling me? If you can hook those two students on the personal benefit to them and the hook of how they can use what they're learning from you in some other way, you got them in the palm of your hand. I'm not going to touch this thing because it'll jerk. Okay, so those are the five steps we're working on. All right, interlude. Teaching, you need to know this, has to be understood as that developmental and dynamic. That's you. What I'm talking about there is you have to continue to develop and evolve. We are not going to admit any of you all into the teaching academy because you're not quite there yet. So it has to be a developmental dynamic process to get you into the teaching academy give you a teaching award, help get you to tenure. The whole idea is it's a lifelong process, continuing to ref reflect on what you're doing, improve on what you're doing, come up with new ways of doing what, you do what you've been doing in the past. Make sure that you understand it's developmental and dynamic. Coincidentally, it is also developmental and dynamic for your students. It's bookended by two things. First of all, you need to help students take personal ownership of their learning. That's the what's in it for me part. The other part of that is, in his research is very clear, he says students do better in classes when the expectations are high. Set high standards for performance, hold them to it, help them achieve it, and you'll smile at the end. It's much more fun for me to click the little button that says A than it is the one down at the bottom that says F. It means we, myself and the student, succeeded. In the middle, give them feedback and lots of it. Make sure that that feedback is meaningful to them and helpful to them. And then make sure you understand that a lot of the learning that's going to take place for every college student is going to happen outside your classroom. It breaks my heart. 7% of what you say in your class is all they'll retain. You're thinking, why not choose a profession like this? It's very true. So take what you're, they're learning in your class and help them build on it inside and outside of class. And that means reading and doing papers and all that good stuff as well. All right, back to the five steps. This is the, everybody remember what this is? What's the first step? Tell them what you're going to tell them. Okay, that's what this is. So course design, you're thinking, i got to teach next week. Who has time for this? Well, hopefully you've already started. I spent about a month each class. I happened to be teaching two in this year and it took me about two months to get ready for my classes and I'd, I'd taught both of them before. It's a lot of work, as you well know. You're thinking, I gotta get ready for Monday. That's okay, you can do this gradually as a new faculty member. Your syllabus is very, very important. And look down the right-hand side of this particular chart. And what you're gonna see is an extension, it's on the syllabus, has to be, SACS, our accrediting agent, makes it be that way. There has to be two things. There have to be student learning outcomes. That's basically what you want the students to know and be able to do when they finish your class. The second is what you should do almost every day in class. If everybody will think about that, you will think that there's a lot of relationship to tell them, tell them what you told them, excuse me, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Every class should have objectives, it should have a review from the previous class, and it should have take-home points. Pretty much every class. Allow time accordingly. Why? The most important thing that students will remember in your class for that class period is the last thing you say, because that's when they're awake. If you can keep them from packing up their backpacks. All right, so the right-hand side in the syllabus and in class. On the left-hand side of the syllabus, or excuse me, on the chart for you, are the assignments. I suggest that you make sure that there's clarity in your assignment, there's, an, there's a purpose, it's really good for your brain, it's really good for their guidance. 
exactly what the tasks are and the criteria for success. That really sets the students up very well. Then make sure that you outline exactly what you want to cover in the class. Right now you're thinking, I just got chapter titles. That'll work for the first semester maybe, but then you might want to embellish that a little bit. But basically an outline with the reading, the chapters, due dates for assignments, this really is the guidance. You give them on the first day, spend what you don't spend on COVID, the rest of the first day spend on your syllabus, and it will serve you very well. Clarity, this is where we're going in this particular class. All right, the benefit to students is not on the left side of this chart. You'd be astounded how many people who teach in our academy, and I don't mean just to Texas Tech, I'm talking about worldwide, think that we're supposed to do those things there. I wrote, I've written a textbook. It is still my responsibility not to cover the textbook. Good grief, who wrote that? That's a piece of you. <clears throat> anyway, it's not to cover the textbook. It's not to cover the 80 slides that you prepared for Tuesday's class. And it is not the last one of three tests and a final. That's not what your job is. This is what your job is for students. I, okay, thank you. I got the heaviest finger. I need to go on a diet with my finger. Okay, I sometimes teach sport, sport marketing and I will have succeeded in teaching that class if I can convince every one of my students that the objective of marketing is to meet the wants and needs of customers. You may not like this metaphor, but students are our customers. We, if we don't meet their needs, they're gone, mentally if not physically, oftentimes both. First of all, you've got to figure out what they know, what questions they want to, want to have answered, and how they want to go about answering those questions. That's important in the benefit to them. If you can't make that connection, you don't have them. Secondly, you want your students to read. The biggest challenge you're going to have as a faculty member is not finding your classroom on the first day. It is getting your students to read. I tell students, I am manipulating you with this, 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 and this strategy to get you to read. I'm just very upfront about it. Because if I can't make it beneficial to them, they will not do it. I don't want to be negative. Come on. In my MBA, somewhere along the line, I took a class. I never even opened the book. Now, I struggled, but it was, he didn't make it connected to the book, so I just kind of, I still struggled. That was my problem. But what I want you to understand is students hate buying a book, it being worthless to them, if you can't make it worthwhile for them to read it. You need to understand you cannot cover the textbook in class, therefore you must hook them in manipulatively, if you will, to do that. In, line qu in class quizzes, in class writing assignments, blogs, discussion boards, and 18 other creative things that you can think about doing. But the students have got to get into the content and you can't cover it all in class, so use whatever strategies you can see used to say, this is going to benefit you. You can actually learn by reading a textbook. You can actually teach them how to do that if you choose to. Metacognitive strategies, which is another two hour lecture that I won't go into today, but you have to understand that today's students, sadly, especially if any of your parents that are, have siblings or relatives, you have to understand that most college students come to college not knowing how to learn. They don't know how to learn. College was not, a, I mean, high school was not a challenge to them. They were smart. They figured out how to do it, and they didn't learn how to learn. And each student is unique in their learning. So one of the things you have to help students do is learn how to learn. If you go to the second part of that with uh, Carol Dweck's concept of a growth mindset, what you have to understand is you have to convince them they can learn. You're teaching organic chemistry. I don't want to learn organic chemistry. I don't know how to learn organic chemistry. Then you have to help them. You have to help them learn how to learn. You wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't figure that out. And you have to understand that not all those students in front of you have that skill. 
There's Sandra McGuire and her daughter wrote a wonderful book about teaching students how to learn. Suzanne can give you that reference anytime you want it. The whole idea is we have to help with the strategies that we use in teaching people, how, our students, how to learn. And convincing them that they can is one of those first steps, and that's the growth mindset that I'm talking about. So if I can do this gently. All right, so that was the benefit to students. All right, the third piece of this is what you're going to do as a teacher. This is what happens, not next week necessarily, but the next week, the next week, the next week, the next week. What you're going to do to teach whatever content it is that you're teaching to your students. How are you going to do it? All right, there's a lot of controversy out there that lecturing is dead, or at least it ought to be imploded. Lecturing has a role. There's just certain things that you need to tell your students, and that's the best, most efficient way of getting it across. That is not every 50-minute, 80-minute class at Texas Tech for the next 15 weeks. That is the wrong way to use lecturing. Lecturing has its place, and you can read on, on the slides what that is. But the key thing is use it some. Don't use it exclusively. And basically the research is very clear. About 15 minutes in, they have tuned you out if you haven't done something to change the format. And the format can be as simple as a think, pray, or share, or a stand up and stretch. But something that changes the pace, a video clip with a question embedded in it. It can be lots of different strategies to change the pace in class. Then you might go back for a 10 minute se session of lecturing and then go right back into some other learning activity that's associated with the key concepts that you want the students to learn. That second piece of that interactive lecturing class, says on the title, is active learning. We have the best, and I've been on seven different university campuses because I can't hold a job. We have the best teaching learning professional development center anywhere in the world. It's outstanding. Sessions on everything. Take advantage of it throughout the fall, the spring, the next fall, the next spring, etc. You don't have to cram it in all this fall. You don't have time to do that. They're wonderful. They're just wonderful. They will give you strategies about how to teach exactly what you're teaching as effectively as possible. Active learning, there are hundreds of different options out there. Take advantage of all those sessions. Learn them. You can always contact me in kinesiology and sport management. I'll be glad to share any resource that I have with you that talks about how you can help students learn more actively, interspersing it in an appropriate manner with lecturing in order to, the second piece, tell them what you're going to tell them. And, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, here are some examples. Guided notes, I'll just illustrate a couple of them. You might have an outline of things that you want to cover in a day and the students can take notes around that. You might leave blanks in your PowerPoint slides that students have to fill in during class. That's an, a strategy. You can use a jigsaw in which you make experts of students by assigning them a topic to, to investigate outside of class and then come back and teach their classmates. I know it's hard to believe and it's kind of offensive to your PhD, but they can actually learn from students. It's, it's okay to learn from each other. And jigsaw is a great way for that to happen, a different approach. You can use rotating stations, which is basically put questions up on some, some poster board on the wall, put them on a whiteboard, put them online, and make sure that you have kind of provocative kind of questions, and then let them go around and answer those questions and discuss them, all kinds of opportunities. I'm not going to go over each of these, but what I want you to understand is there's a lot of active learning options out there. You don't have to learn them all. You don't have to do them all. You might find your favorite. My favorite is the quick and dirty think, pair, share. Phrase a question. Let them think about an answer. Turn to a partner. Yes, with a seat or two in between you so you don't breathe on someone. But think, talk, and then come back and report out. Or you don't have to report out. Just however you want to do it. It breaks up the, the lecturing, and it should be reinforcing to the key concepts you want to make. Or you can use any of the online polling devices like Poll Everywhere or Turning Technologies, Turning Point. Lots of opportunities out there. Find what works for you and do it. If you don't know how to do it, the resources in the TLPDC are wonderful for that to happen. I like review games. Jeopardy's my favorite. Need a template? I'll send it to you. All right. Now this is a little bit 
twisty, so hang with me on this one. This is the third part of the Aristotelian triptych. I'm working on that. All right, the, this is the tell them what you told them part. But I'm turning it a little bit on its head because what I want you to understand here is the importance of assessment. Now, I am now over 40 years into higher education and I finally figured this out. So th I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to school you so you'll never miss this question on a quiz or in a game show or anything like that. But it's so important and we have not historically in higher education done enough of this. There's three different types that I want you to understand as a way of telling them what you've told them but making it go over the entire semester. All right, at the top, assessment as learning. You can call it diagnostic. You can call it, call it self-assessment. You can call it pre-assessment. It's all saying the same thing. Where are those students? If you remember, that was one of the things in the first point for students, which was, what's in it for me? All right. Find, first of all, you need to find out where they are. They need to find out where they are. They may know, think they know something they don't, or they may know more than they thought they did about a particular topic. And so you need to use these kind of assessments throughout the semester, but especially at the beginning of the semester to find out where people are, ask them some questions, give them some, some, some quiz questions, have a discussion in class, whatever it is that's your best approach and figure out where they are. This is assessment as learning when they're reading the textbook. Give them some questions to answer in reading chapter 14 or whatever it might be. This is them helping themselves. This is part of the, this is actually a metacognitive strategy that they can use to self-assess. So that's assessment as learning. The second is assessment for learning. This should absolutely be used throughout the entire semester, heavily loaded a little bit more in the, the, the beginning and the middle. And it basically is what in the lingo of the profession is low stakes. This is that two-point quiz in the middle of class. This is a five-point in-class exploratory writing question. It might actually be an extra credit opportunity for students. Basically, a, a assessment for learning is you're learning while you're doing that. And we sometimes think students are with us, and I don't know how in the world I'm going to read my students with masks on. I'm struggling right now with you, and you, you don't, we don't realize until we can't see how important expressions are. That's why I do not like to teach online. Did I do it last spring? Yes. Did I want to? No. But we may be back there in a month or next week, whatever the case might be. So formative assessments are really, really important because we're not going to get some of that feedback from students, mask, or just because they won't communicate with us. So the key thing on formative assessments is helping them learn as they're assessing themselves. We all know the third one. It, I won't spend much time on it. You might like the word grades. It's summative. And it's higher stakes. Again, I would, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of one assessment in law schools across the country in which everything rides on one test or one paper at the end. This is much more feedback for them. Summative assessments can happen at any point in time this semester. They tend to be in units and modules and final exams and that sort of thing. This is really an assessment of learning. This harkens all the way back to those student learning outcomes. And it's very, very important. This is the fastest clicker in the West. You are in West Texas, by the way. All right, this is number five. This is what use am I ever going to make of that stuff you taught me? Benefit at the beginning, the hook. Toward the end of the semester, you better be making it very relevant. You're going to build on this in the next course. This is really important for your internship that's coming up. You're going to have a project in the next class upon which you have to have this information, whatever it might be. This particular point five is how you help students make an action plan. And that action plan has these particular characteristics to it. But you've got to be able to convince your students that what they are and have 
are learning and have learned in your class is foundational to what's going to come next and what's going to come next. Even if it's general education or the Texas core, a lot of that information will help them later in their careers. Also, it's very important to understand that they, they can use the, the courses that you may be teaching to help them learn how to learn and develop that growth mindset. The whole idea here is for students to see, ah, now I see the relevancy to me. And that's the key. All right, let's put it all together. Let's review. Remember, I told you what I was going to tell you. I told you. And now I'm telling you what I've told you. So this is the last part again. All right, so first of all, the importance of the syllabus, the importance of designing the class so that the students have a road map. The, if you drove here, you probably use GPS or your phone app or something to get to West Texas. Some of you may never have been to Lubbock before because you even interviewed virtually. So this may be a first. You liked having a road map. I'm old enough to remember road maps. Couldn't read them then, still can't. Love apps to tell me how to get there. But the syllabus is the tell you how to get there. Secondly, what's the benefit to students? If you don't hook them, you're going to lose them. The third is in telling them. It's not just lecturing, like you've been so patient to listen to me lecture this morning. But it's really an interspersing of the content that only you can present in a certain way that helps them solidify and synthesize the things that you've put together. But it's also that they learn best through participation. Most of you say, I learn by doing. Our students learn by doing. Many of them are very tactile, think about the technology, and very hands-on learners. They want you to give them the opportunity to learn by doing. So the idea of the content, it has to be a combination appropriate to your discipline of the lecture and the active learning activities. And then make sure that you're continually going to review. You're co continually revisiting those things that you think are the most important. So you're not covering the content of the entire textbook. You are the content expert, and your job is to pick out the highlights, the most important concepts that you want them to learn. All right, let's go back to my 7%. If students are only going to retain 7% of what we teach them, I won't make you show your hands, but I think it would be unanimous that you would rather you pick the 7% than them. Therefore, do that. Pick the most important concept that you want the students to leave with. Go back to my marketing example. I want every marketing student to understand that you will not be successful in any business that you're marketing unless you meet the wants and needs of your customers. All right, if that's the most important point, I tell them on the first day, I tell them multiple times in the semester, and if I ask them at the end, what's the most important thing you learned in class the entire semester? And they tell me that. If I had a free hand, I'd pat myself on the back because that's exactly what I want them to happen. So the whole idea is you pick the 7% and not them. Make sure that you use assessments to increase the learning of students. You can do it pre-diagnostic, you can do it formative, and you can do it summative. Assessments are underutilized in higher education and need to be used more. And then make it real to them. Make sure that you have students who see the relevancy of what you're teaching. Go back to one of the very first points I said, care about your students, enjoy teaching them, and welcome to Texas Tech. Thank you very much. To the front of the room, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Genevieve Durham de Cicero, Dr. Jacqueline Kanyas Carroll, and Dr. Rob Stewart to join us. This is like the dream team coming to the front of the room right now, representing the Office of the Provost. Um, you have a unique opportunity to have these three rock stars in front of you and to ask them questions. It could be about anything. It could be about COVID. It could be about teaching. It could be about a policy you've heard about. So it's an open book. 
they would love to speak with you. Because we're recording today, um, I'm gonna give one wireless, I have one mic, and then we're gonna use the podium mic, and I'm gonna ask them to repeat the question that they are asked so that our guests who are with us virtually will be able to hear those. Remember, if you're joining us virtually, you can always email me questions, and we'll be following up at the end of orientation, giving you even more information to make sure we cover our bases. Good morning, everyone. My name is Genevieve Durham de Cicero. I serve as a Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, and I'm transitioning into an interim deanship in the JT and Margaret Talkington College of Visual and Performing Arts. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you for being with us. We want to make space for our, uh, my colleagues to introduce themselves, and then we want to get right to your questions. Jacqueline? Nope. I think it's working now. Okay, I'm Jacqueline Cañas Carroll. I'm a professor in environmental toxicology and um, the outgoing director of STEM Corps and the incoming uh, interim vice provost um, taking over some of Genevieve's responsibilities. Hello, I'm Rob Stewart, senior vice provost. And if I knew we were gonna be rock stars, I would have brought my guitar so I could smash it on the stage. But uh, we'll do our best to uh, entertain your questions over the next few minutes. Uh, we certainly have a knowledge, uh, a knowledge bank represented here on the stage, uh, part of which is to refer you elsewhere if we don't have the immediate answers. And uh, we'll certainly be able to get back to you uh, on any questions that might be asked that we can't answer here uh, immediately. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're excited uh, that you're now part of Texas Tech University, uh, especially in the faculty role and we know that you're going to benefit and contribute greatly to uh, our students in your respective programs. Uh, we look forward to that partnership for many years to come. So we'll start with questions uh, from you and uh, we'll pass the baton as it were uh, as questions arise. These could be questions spurred by comments you heard from others this morning or that you haven't heard anything about at all and uh, we'll, we'll try to answer those. There's two hands here. We'll go with the red shirt. I, I, I don't understand the scope of the office of the provost. Um, what is the scope of the office of the provost? Nor do we. Mm -mm. So. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, let me give a shot at that one. The provost is, you know, as the chief academic officer, so is essentially where the buck stops with respect to all matters academic. That includes academic personnel, academic programs, uh, student academic issues and concerns, uh, and so forth. Um, all the deans report directly to the provost. Uh, the deans are accountable uh, to the provost. Uh, those who work uh, with the deans, their associate deans and, and department chairs or school directors, Likewise, uh, then are accountable through the deans uh, to the provost's office as well. The provost's office uh, oversees through vice provosts international affairs, uh, graduate and postdoctoral affairs uh, through Dean Sheridan, vice provost for graduate and postdoc affairs, um, e-learning as we call it at Texas Tech, which is our distance education uh, programs and, and uh, our off-campus sites around the state. Uh, there's a Vice Provost, Dr. Melanie Hart, that oversees those. An area we call institutional effectiveness, which is the accreditation concerns of the institution. Uh, Vice Provost uh, Daryl James uh, oversees that area. An area we call university studies and student success, or university programs and student success. That's predominantly uh, overseeing the university advising and matriculation and some university level degree programs for undergraduates that don't have a program in a specific college. Uh, we have a vice provost, Dr. Patrick Hughes, overseeing that area. You heard the president this morning speak about retention. Uh, that office has a great deal to do with retention efforts of the institution uh, as well. And then student affairs uh, at Texas Tech University is under the oversight of a vice provost, Dr. Kathy Duran and uh, she, uh, of course, res uh, is responsible for all matters having to do with student life, student concerns, uh, student conduct, um, and, and those matters. So if that addresses scope, that's, that's the provost's office at Texas Tech. So, uh -huh. And then there was a question right there. I 
Yes, yeah, so STEM Corps is the STEM Center for Outreach, Research, and Education. Um, and we report to the provost um, in the center, right? We have a director and we report to the, to the provost. So our scope really is, for those of you in STEM, um, is we work with faculty. So we try to be a service to faculty. We work with faculty to um, develop the education piece to some of your proposals. So if you're familiar with, and maybe some of you aren't, but if you apply to NSF, right, you have to have a broader impact. So that's something that our office can help to do. We won't write it for you, but we will certainly consult with you. We know um, all of the STEM outreach and education programs that are happening on campus, um, in the city, in the school districts, so that we can listen to you and you can tell us, okay, well, this is my research area, um, and these are some ideas I have for broader impacts. What do you think, or can you help me to find something? And so we have one-on-one -on -one consultations with STEM faculty who are developing proposals. And even if you're, you want to just meet with us even before you have a proposal so you can think about the broader impacts um, that you would include in such proposals, then we can meet with you and help you to brainstorm that. And then once you've actually developed and written the proposal part, we'll read the whole thing, including the scientific and the um, technical pieces, to make sure that it really helps and fits in with what you're proposing to do. And then sometimes, um, depending on the nature of what you're going to do, you can also write us into the grant, and then we will help you to administer that outreach part um, that you have to do, and so if you're, if you're funded, we help to carry that out. Sure. So we, we, our office does not do the actual assessment. What we would do is we would get you in touch with somebody in the College of Education, so that's another piece that our, our office does, is we bring groups of people, to, of faculty across campus together to be able to write proposals. Um, and so if you came to us and you said, I've got this great idea, and we're like, yeah, that sounds great. You're like, I don't know the first thing about assessment. We'll tell you we don't either. Um, and that we will get somebody from College of Education to collaborate with you. Looks like we've got one here. So to pick up on that, are there existing initiatives to maybe stretch STEM to STEAM or humanities? Sorry, I'm the director of the school of Hi, Dane. Good question. Hi. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so we have in the last year, so I was the director for this last year, I've been an associate director for several years before that, but we've had lots of conversations about wanting to do something um, in the realm of STEAM. And uh, we think that would be a big sell to NSF, National Science Foundation. Um, so we'd love to speak with you and, um, because we've had several faculty from um, that college, you know, we talk about it, but nobody's actually done anything of bringing people together, and, and it sounds like we can do that now. Dane's question was about whether STEM Core uh, might expand at some point to be STEAM Core. Um, we also do have a dedicated humanities center on campus that facilitates some similar work with more humanities-based faculty members. So the question is about the role of outreach engagement um, in, in teaching, excuse me, tenure and promotion or other advancement processes. I'm going to actually ask Dr. Stewart to take that one. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, I think you heard Dr. Gallion mention something about that this morning uh, as he talked about the responsibilities of faculty. If you've looked at the university's strategic plan, you'll see that um, one of the three priorities of the institution is summatively outreach and engagement um, and, and a significant part of that is uh, what we would call academic uh, outreach and engagement and so we have actually put into um, your letters of appointment that you received probably in the addendum there was something said about if that's an interest area of yours it's something for which we want you to uh, certainly take initiative and be involved with and be credited for uh, as you progress. 
and whether, whether that outreach and engagement um, interfaces most closely with your teaching or with your um, research or creative activity, um, that it's, it's part of what you uh, can do in those, in those areas and be accountable for. So it's a conversation to have with your chair uh, or your director about how that fits into your um, performance profile and, and whether that you know is working with schools or with agencies or um, with others on campus, with business entities, um, those, those are all exciting and, and potential parts of that endeavor. Uh, we have an office uh, that um, uh, is concerned with, with academic outreach and engagement and is uh, sort of um, the center point for that, that priority in the, um, in the strategic plan and uh, works closely with our office as well as other offices on campus. So uh, at least introductorily, I hope that's a, a response that, that helps you. And if there's more you need in the way of detail on that, get in touch with us. We'll, we'll help you out. Good question. Other questions? Comments? The question is about what kinds of projects can be funded um, uh, given our designation as an HSI, an Hispanic serving institution. I can address that. I don't think your mic's on. There we go. Yeah, you gotta work technology. Um, so related to Hispanic serving institutions, so um, a few years ago we had a committee related to the idea of Texas Tech becoming an HSI, and we were on the cusp of it. Uh, so we did a lot of work in looking at what types of grants um, and funding could be applied for once we were an HSI, which we are now. Um, and so there are, there's quite a bit of funding actually um, out there that is specific for Hispanic serving institutions. Um, so I know in the STEM world especially, there's a lot of funding. There's also the Department of Education has a substan substantial amount of funding that um, is available only for Hispanic serving institutions. So I would encourage all of you uh, to just even, whatever agency you're going to be applying to, um, to look at what special programs they do have. And one thing we were, so one of the things we did as part of that committee is we looked at um, all the funding agencies try to find the different funding mechanisms. And so the, the Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation on their website does have somewhere where they've got a list of the different programs. Um, and they try to keep that updated. I believe sometimes they send out a, I, don't, I think it's a weekly email that comes from that office um, that has some of the com up, com up and coming funding opportunities. And as part of that, sometimes they will specifically highlight the ones that are Hispanic serving institution um, opportunities. And so um, if you're interested in that and you want more information, feel free to contact me. Uh, I can point you in the right direction um, or get you connected with some people because there are a lot of people on this campus that are interested in going after that funding. Just as a follow-up to Jacqueline's comments, uh, you can also um, access some resources through Dr. Carol Sumner, our Chief Diversity Officer, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, and that unit's main webpage does have some information on it specific to your question. Yes. Oh, oh, there's, yeah, that's a great question. We, uh, I, I, the question is, how is Lubbock, West Texas, geographically? Um, well, we're, you could argue, one might suggest that we are close enough to the border with New Mexico that given the size of Texas, takes about 13 hours to get across Texas from farthest east point to farthest west point. We're about an hour from the New Mexico border. So 
in Texas terms, that's west. Another way Thank to look you. At it. I-35 goes straight down Dallas-Fort Worth. <laughs> in terms of navigating the university, that's a great question, actually, um, because Texas Tech is very, very large in terms of the size of the campus. A great way to do this is to find some time, several hours are, are generally needed, to take a walking tour. Um, you can do this uh, one of, uh, of several ways, is just going around the perimeter of the campus. We do have a dedicated sidewalk that will take you uh, on about a four, four and a half mile loop around the campus. You can also, um, uh, on your own, follow the public art tour, and that will really take you um, internal to campus and give you a sense of where all the different buildings are. You might be teaching this fall in spaces that you would not normally be in because of our classroom capacity. Uh, and so that's a great way to get acquainted with the buildings on campus and where different things are located. Uh, that's pretty, a pretty generic answer, but if anyone has more specific questions about sort of the university or if my colleagues would like to offer thoughts, please go ahead. In the back One here. thing, oh sorry. I, was going to add to what um, Genevieve said. So as far as navigating, so you all are coming in in a challenging time because probably most every workshop on campus is probably going to be virtual, right? But I would still encourage you to, to attend as many of those as you can because that's where you'll get to know some of the key people across campus. Right? You'll get to know the TLPDC and some of the other offices on campus that are offering workshops. And I think that's one way to start navigating the university is to start figuring out who some of the key people are and some of the key offices. Um, the Office for Vice President for Research and Innovation does a whole thing for new faculty, mm -hmm. um, a whole series of workshops. And so I would highly encourage that you take part in that because they talk about from the Office of um, research services to all sorts of the different funding opportunities they they do a really excellent job so that's one way to start navigating the university back there that's a great question. I don't, I don't believe we have a new faculty tour available, but we're going to start one, gosh darn it. Um, great, oh, that got applause, fantastic. Yeah, we will. We'll follow up immediately and see if we can get a, a date and um, uh, something ready to go with a few options so that anybody could join. Uh, thanks. Great suggestion. While you're thinking of other questions to ask, I also wanted to add, um, we spoke about STEM Core, the Humanities Center. I should have also noted that we do have a dedicated center called the Commons uh, that looks at exploring creative processes. If you are interested in any of these centers, um, you can certainly find them on uh, TTU's web pages. You're also welcome to reach out to any of us for more information. Yes. She's asking about programs uh, for interdisciplinary collaboration. We have, we have a number of those. Um, some of them are going to be specific to collaborations within individual colleges. So depending on your home college, I would certainly encourage you to start speaking with your uh, department chairperson or school director, um, associate deans about in, uh, internal college opportunities for inter and cross and multidisciplinary collaborations in terms of across the institution as a whole. Let's see, VPR's office has some available. Am I remembering that correctly? Well, uh, the Humanities Center mm -hmm. uh, has as its very purpose uh, to try to uh, foster interdisciplinary work, uh, not only among humanities, but across the arts and, and social sciences and, and sciences. They've had some engagements of that sort as well. Um, I don't know what extent they're continuing them since we went into the lockdown in, in March, but the VP and R and I's office uh, had what they called um, faculty office hours or, 
or something of that sort where once a month they were gathering for um, what back in the day was, was a wine and cheese gathering, uh, is more recently probably a Zoom gathering, bring your own wine and cheese perhaps. And, and they would feature three or four different mm -hmm. um, research programs, uh, creative artists talking about what they do in the way of scholarship and, and sort of seeding the potential for some interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary interaction. A whole vast number of projects has come out of those uh, endeavors over the last couple of years uh, as well. Uh, so there's opportunities like those. We, we have uh, what's called the um, Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Um, it just went from a, a directory structure to a faculty committee structure, partly in, in the effort to, to generate more actual interdisciplinary activities. So you may be hearing something from that committee uh, in the coming year as well. So we have a number of these entities that, that are uh, already developed and established and trying to foster that kind of work. And a lot of the other, as, as Genevieve mentioned, is, is within colleges mm -hmm. and even departments uh, by faculty's own initiatives trying to reach out and, and discover opportunities with each other. We also have the Innovation Hub, which is actually not far from the museum. And uh, while this is really a, a, an enterprise dedicated primarily to um, helping to support uh, new entrepreneurs, there are interdisciplinary projects that are funded through the Innovation Hub, and we would encourage you to check out that, that center's website. So this is particularly applicable to faculty who are on visa, some sort of they need help for uh, for their visa or uh, something that is, that makes them you know uh, more comfortable to work here and given the restriction condition and uh, for, for this public situation we have longer time uh, for this situation. So where can we seek help and what can we offer students? I would direct you to uh, the Office of International Affairs. Where we, it's right, right behind there. us <laughs> on the, uh, the building to our immediate south. And uh, they have specialists mm -hmm. that will work on those uh, very issues with you. Uh, that's part of what they're there for, is to work with uh, international uh, faculty. Uh, they have what they call the International Scholars Office, and, and that's faculty and postdocs. Uh, largely, they also do the same for students, of course, graduate and undergraduate, um, as well as helping U.S. domestic faculty engage in those things abroad also. So that, that's your best direct source of information and assistance on those matters. Yeah. OIA is also going to be your best resource if you have graduate students with questions about um, similar things. Uh, please, this is a, an office that has dedicated people to support international faculty and students. So please take a visit. Yeah. So I, I, I know that there have been a bit of guidelines that was issued regarding you know, student attendance because of uh, COVID-19 direct infection or exposure. We talked earlier about the activities with the health issues uh, are there going to be formal guidelines issued or is there any guidance for faculty with respect to not necessarily direct exposure, but rather the sort of indirect trauma and mental health issues that they Well, I think we, in terms of attendance and, and leeway for students with that respect, that um, I think we would take their comments or, or even uh, instructions that they may be getting from a provider that's more on the emotional or mental health side of things, just as if it were sniffles and a cough, and, and uh, allow some leeway uh, with respect to attendance uh, for those matters. Uh, as far as guidance on where to provide them assistance, you can direct them to um, uh, the Office of Student Affairs, the Dean of Students Office can work with them directly. The Student Counseling Center, um, if, you, if you make your way back to campus across the, the bridge over the freeway, um, you probably run into the Student Health Services Center, the Student Wellness Center, um, and they, they certainly have counseling available there. So maybe that's some guidance we need to be more specific about because it's uh, clearly not 
uh, as readily accessible as, as maybe we think it is by virtue of the question. So we'll look into that as a more specific form of guidance. But in the meanwhile, those are, those are some uh, avenues to consider also. You may want to add something to that. I just offer that um, uh, Student Affairs has really um, been nimble in, in making uh, available resources for students specifically online in terms of um, virtual counseling opportunities on pretty, for, uh, pretty much 24-7 uh, basis. For faculty members, we also do have dedicated resources available. Um, that are a little bit different from student resources. I, I think you've likely received information about that, um, but if not, please feel free to contact any one of us. We do have uh, wonderful programs that faculty can take advantage of, um, especially uh, as we head into a, an unprecedented fall semester. protocols we, we had a meeting on this uh, topic, well, it was on a number of COVID related issues, but this topic came up uh, at the system level, that is the chancellor's level. And none of the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Centers nor um, our other uh, comprehensive institution, Angelo State University, uh, North Texas Tech University, wants to assume that there's a magic number uh, that would, would be a tipping point or a pivot point uh, for doing a UNC or even a Notre Dame. Um, rather, um, the, the intent is to keep options open and to monitor on a daily basis, truly, any number of factors. Um, there, there's what's happening in the community, of course. Uh, there's what's happening in different parts of campus, not just citywide or, or campus-wide. Um, I think someone mentioned in uh, a, a moment I was listening to the sessions online this morning but wasn't looking at the screen, um, either the president or the provost mentioning about uh, micro-closures, the idea that there might be a period of time when a class might pivot um, for a, a period of quarantine or what have you. Um, there might be a time when a lab or uh, a building might pivot uh, because of uh, exposure and, and outbreak in that, in that particular facility. So the idea at Texas Tech University is that um, if we abide by the protocols we have in place that we believe are as best guided as possible by the CDC and, and uh, our own medical advisors, including our health sciences centers, um, that we, we can probably manage uh, those kinds of opportunities before we would have to pivot to a fully online or remote type of activity. Uh, I don't know anything about the details of UNC or Notre Dame's or Michigan State's protocols to compare them to our own protocols. But some of our protocols parallel very much uh, what we've seen in the Big 12 uh, institutions whom we've been in contact with uh, as, you know, provost offices, uh, student affairs offices, uh, housing and, and dining offices uh, across the conferences and across the country have been in con concert with each other about, about these things. And of course, every institution is different just as every individual is different and uh, responding somewhat differently to these things. So, um, you know, it's a let's watch, let's be cognizant, let's be uh, vigilant, uh, let's take care of ourselves, let's be persistent with our students to be wearing their masks. I was sitting back there for about 15 minutes. It doesn't take long for it to get uncomfortable, but we have to persist, and, and we have to model that persistence to them as well. And uh, there's a lot of communication uh, we hope is being uh, distributed, uh, even some yet to come as we approach the first day of classes. How you manage things on the first day of class is going to be instrumental in setting up these expectations. I think we've already seen that students will help take care of this through peer pressure, through expectations of each other, toward each other. Uh, I know our student government officers, uh, they're ahead of us on some of this. <laughs> they, they want this to work. 
and, and they want it to be safe. Uh, and, and to hear our president, um, Hunter Heck, uh, talk about these things, uh, you would think she was the one designing them all. She's, she's very eloquent about the importance of this, and I think that's going to get out to the student body uh, as we move forward. So I don't know if that answers your specific concern, but uh, we're not those institutions, and, and we're trying to do things as best we know how and can at Texas Tech University. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question down here. The question is about managing startup funding and whether um, COVID-related matters could affect startup funding. I think that I was hearing your question correctly. Uh, Rob? Well, the startup funding that you were offered uh, in your appointment uh, is intact. Um, I don't know of, of any exceptions to that at this point. Faculty who were in their period of startup funding as of last March I think I've been uh, granted consideration of, a, of an extension of that three-year period uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, if you have any particular concerns or questions about that, you, you can take that up with your department chair. And, and if the department chair thinks you need additional guidance, you can certainly get with uh, the VPR and I's office or the associate dean for research in your college can be of assistance there as, as well. Now, you know, going forward, um, you know, we, we have a lot ahead of us in determining certain um, ongoing uh, budgetary concerns. You heard the president speak this morning about what fine condition Texas Tech is in, all things considered. And so I'd take confidence in that um, and, and that your funding should be, uh, should be okay to get started. Mm -hmm. Now, things such as facilities um, that might have been part of that startup um, you know, who knows where uh, delays might be seen in that regard. You might be watching for that, talking to your chair about those potentialities. And I mean that just in terms of distribution of goods and services uh, under the pandemic and, and how those might affect certain remodels or, um, you know, the trucking of certain kinds of equipment or things of that nature could certainly be impacted. Please be engaged with reaching out to your department chairs, school directors to ask these questions. And I see Suzanne walking slowly down the aisle, which means that our time is up. Please don't hesitate to send any questions to us via email. email. We're happy to respond to you. And welcome to Texas Tech University. Thank you very much. We're glad you're here. Thank you to Genevieve, Jacqueline, and Rob. Much appreciated. Um, a few things to note. I've been taking notes as we talked, and I'll follow up as I promised with some information. Um, just a quick um, commercial to say that we have a session at the TLPDC on what to do on the first day. We'll talk about some of the policies and practices. That will be on Friday afternoon. Of course, it'll be recorded. If you have a conflict, I'll gladly send that to you. Um, I also want to note that we will have some trauma-based pedagogy sessions coming soon um, that might address some of the questions that were raised. Now, an event like today's did not come off at the hand of one person. Um, you can imagine that there were many, many people involved in this. We had colleagues from the Division of IT assisting. Um, we had someone taking pictures, Neil Hinkle. Um, and my dear colleagues and teammates at the TLPDC, would you just join me in giving them a hand?